Hello and welcome to the April 24, 2024 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. We have all members present tonight and staff Aaron Jock and Dave Zomek. Uh, first up on our agenda is my report. I just want to congratulate Bruce Stedman for his right. completion of the MACC. Bruce, is there any words you'd like to impart upon us now or perhaps yeah, it's later a very, in Yes, it's a very zippy certificate of examination. Okay. What was that, Bruce? I didn't get a, a very zippy certificate that they sent me. What does zippy mean for a certificate? Oh, like it, it moves weird. around? It, it's just weird that they would even do it, but I don't know. I, I learned some good things. I was especially, the, the session that was in Jason's arena was especially good about flood issues and water management, that one was especially good. Some of them weren't that well taught, I must say. But anyway, I went through it, learned some good things. End of story. Great, well, thank you for putting the time in on that. Um, all right, so that's all I have. So I'll hand it to Dave for director's reports. Sure, thanks, Michelle. A couple of uh, quick updates on on larger projects in town and happy to take any questions, but I'm pleased to let the commission know we are underway uh, with the trails at Hickory Ridge. Um, as you may recall, we uh, hired Taylor Davis. They were the uh, low bidder on the project and we're very uh, happy uh, that they were. They're local and they know us and they know the site quite well because their, their main right headquarters is right down the street. So uh, they are kicked off. We have all of our turtle barrier and sediment control in place. Erin uh, organized a, a, an outstanding uh, turtle training for, uh, uh, we had about 25, 27 people there, uh, including many town staff. Our town engineer came, uh, the, the fire department personnel came, uh, Pure Sky, their consultants, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and many others. So it was uh, it was great to have everybody there. Um, the main focus will be on the Loop Trail uh, right out of the gate. That's the trail along West Pomeroy Lane that you can you can actually see the turtle barrier slash silt fence up uh, as you drive by. Um, there's equipment in the parking lot, and um, with the with decent weather, we are we're underway. So we're excited to get that going. Again, I don't want to predict, uh, it's not a long construction period, we hope, because we have some grant funding kind of riding on it all, but I... Oh, you muted yourself, Dave, giving sorry. You, uh, giving you a date, um, but uh, weather permitting, we're going to go quickly. This is a six foot wide Crestone Trail with some benches and kiosks, so let's hope for the best in terms of weather. So um, that's going well out at Hickory. Um, the town is also a project uh, I'm involved with and many other uh, town staff are involved with. We're kicking off the uh, Wayfinders affordable housing project um, off of uh, uh, near the E Street School and 70 Belcher Town Road. Um, the planning staff is working closely on this uh, with, with myself and Aaron. And you will be hearing from Wayfinders uh, and the town on that project coming up uh, later this summer, early fall. Um, this is, recall, we're reusing, uh, we're repurposing the East Street School or, or Wayfinders is, and then we, the town, uh, purchased some land off of Belchertown Road that happens to abut the Fort River Farm Conservation Area, and uh, there'll be about 78 units of uh, uh, affordable housing in those two developments. So really excited. It will be a 40B. So it will be, um, you know, primarily going through the um, through the uh, zoning board of appeals, but the commission will um, have a role in this as well. And then, um, Aaron, as I recall, the town will have kind of a parallel project on the East Street School property, which is there is an old failed culvert that we would like to improve, and uh, we just recently hired a. Uh, a consultant or we're on the verge of hiring a consultant to help us with that project. And it might actually be a stream daylighting project. So it could be really pretty cool. And and uh, we're looking forward to bringing that to you as well. Um, so we've got Hickory underway, East Street School, Belchestown Road, the Wayfinders project will be getting underway 
later, um, probably midsummer. And then I think later on in your agenda, under um, other business, there is um, um, there is a reference to an emergency cert that I authorized uh, yesterday or Monday, I believe. Um, we, if you're familiar with the KC Trail Bridge off of Southeast Street, uh, this is a footbridge that goes over the Hop Brook. And uh, with some of these recent rains, uh, we had a um, one of the abutments basically fall in and um, the stream has significantly undermined the um, the uh, east abutment of the uh, of the bridge. So we had a number of people call and uh, concerned about someone getting hurt down there. We went down with staff, including our building commissioner, and uh, um, decided we needed to do something as quickly as possible. So we'll we'll have more on that, I think, under other business later. I don't want to throw off your agenda now, but uh, we came up with, I think, a very uh, a very well thought out and minimally impactful um, uh, short term solution to try to stabilize the bank and also um, make sure our bridge didn't wash into the hop brook. Um, so those are the main um, main updates for you today. Um, I don't want to go into detail tonight, but I, I will say that uh, staff and I, including the fire department, are making good progress on a, a possible emergency access at um, 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 Hickory Ridge. Uh, so we're we're going to be meeting with your sky, uh, I imagine, next week to talk about that that possibility. So um, good discussions going on there, and I'm I'm pretty hopeful we'll have we'll have a, a viable solution. Um, so that's all I have for this evening. Happy to take Thanks, any Dave. questions on those quick updates. Any questions, commissioners? Okay, seeing none, um, let's move on to land use applications. This is a Mount Pollux wedding. Do we have someone here? I don't I don't think we need to. Yeah, okay. So Aaron's been in communication with the applicant and um, I don't know, these are pretty routine <laughs> by now. So I think you've relayed that take take all the trash out with them. Yep, they've only got a few folding chairs. They understand the parking and that it's not close to the public during the ceremony or any other time. So I think that's it. Yep, okay. Um, I think we need a motion to approve the land use application for the Mount Pollux wedding. I don't have the date on me. I can uh, tell you the date and uh, it is- uh, Can I ask you a quick question? Are we getting more of these than we normally do? I don't think so. Okay. I don't. I mean, it's wedding season, so it's yeah. hard to tell so far. But um, um, okay. I think this yeah. is the first that we've got this year. Okay. Not that yeah, surprising. I think this is the first uh, <laughs> eloping ceremony I've ever seen. Yes, and it's on uh, June June eighth. It's scheduled for, and they are um, nearby to Mount Pollux. They're residents, so they have their own parking. They're only planning on bringing a couple chairs and they said that they'd welcome the public attending if they want, you know, people come up or whatever they said. They understand the public has access. Okay, great. Go ahead, Alex. Did I miss um, voting on the minutes? Oh, I missed the vote on the minutes. But let's let's just finish this up and then I'll get back to that. All right, so I move to approve the... Um... Uh, I'll is second it, it Andre. <laughs> what? Uh, let Andre finish the motion, and, Sorry. Then, and then you got it, Lord. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Andre. Um, yeah, I move to uh, approve the uh, request for uh, public land use for Mount Pollux on what's the date? June eighth. On June eighth, twenty twenty four. And I second that. Andrea on the motion, Laura on the second, Rachel. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Laura. Aye. Namanai. Okay. Uh, minutes. We're tabling these to five eight. Yeah, I got about halfway through uh, Bruce's draft, but it has been a really really tough week for me so um i wasn't able to get all the way through with edits no problem and thanks as always for taking the minutes bruce 
Okay, uh, moving on to hearings. So general procedure for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. It's five minutes of comments from staff, five minutes uh, by the applicant, five minutes for the public or two minutes per person, and five minutes for each conservation commissioner or for the conservation commissioners. So for revisions, the commissioners require all submitted and revised materials to be submitted for by Wednesday, the week prior to the meeting at the close of business. And for all presenters, please clearly state your name, the address of the project, who you're representing, as well as if you have preferred pronouns. For all members of the public, clearly state your name, address, and preferred pronouns. Okay, first up. So Michelle, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but we can't start hearings until 7.30. Okay, um, let's move down to other business. Um, should we do our emergency certifications and yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so the first, uh, that I have on the, uh, on the PowerPoint is, um, for Eastman Lane, um, UMass had a situation with a road collapse, um, and it was caused by a failed culvert under Eastman Lane, just, east of the North Amherst fire station. It's the road that goes between where the North Amherst fire station is and the dormitories on UMass campus. So um, the road is currently closed and they have um, come up with a design solution to replace the failed culvert and um, repair the road. Um, I did not have any concerns. They already had erosion control barrier set up. Um, they have a pretty slick setup for their dewatering operation because there was already um, some catch basins which were on either side of the road that water could be um, pumped out of and over the road and into the other catch basin basically directing it back to the same outlet um, for the stream so that worked out well and um, yeah they anticipated starting work Tuesday or Wednesday so Unless anybody has any questions, um, it's a pretty straightforward one. And I can pull up pictures if anyone wants to see. They're also in your packet. Go ahead, Alex. So that's more like a sinkhole, right? Uh, it was a sinkhole that formed in the road and the road started to collapse in the sinkhole, yes. Yeah, pretty, pretty big deal. Yes, pretty big deal. It was a... Uh, pretty major emergency. <laughs> it was a big emergency week. I go by it all the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. Do you want to, are you bringing yep. things up or? Um, I can, if you want to, or I can okay. just move into the next. Um, I put them together in a motion to be approved together. Um, the, Second emergency certification was for uh, the bridge repair on Southeast Street that Dave mentioned. Um, it's uh, the, the path that originates on Southeast Street and goes over the Hot Brook, um, recently constructed footbridge and the um, slumping of the bank underneath the bridge necessitated some sort of stabilization measures. So the plan was formulated to put um, landscaping fabric and then hand placed stone um, under the bridge using the abutment sort of to brace the bottom of the, the stone and building up to the top. There's also photos of this in your packets. If anybody wants, I can also pull it up to share. Um, but if anybody has questions for Dave or I on that, we're happy to field them. Oh, um, one other quick piece of that is that we did submit a um, checklist to natural heritage because it is located in an HESP habitat area. Um, we notified them as part of the emergency certification process and issued a checklist to them right away with a plan and explanation. So um, they are in the loop as well. Michelle, if I could add that we also hired an environmental um, monitor to come out to the site from Goddard Consulting. Um, that consultant um, came out to the site before work began and did a thorough search. Our concern is that the bridge is in estimated and priority habitat, um, likely certain turtle habitat. Um, so um, the consultant did a thorough search of the bank, um, a very thorough search. We were 
we were quite surprised because it was a very cold morning and uh, um, he reached in every nook and cranny uh, under that uh, that bridge and uh, was looking for any turtles that might be uh, might have spent time in there either in, during the winter or or short term here on some of these warm days. But um, I just want to emphasize that um, despite the possible need to use equipment, uh, we decided to actually do all of this work by hand. So staff went down with uh, wheelbarrows and literally uh, picked up every stone uh, that was brought to the site and then hand placed them um, under the bridge uh, to stabilize the bank as Aaron uh, indicated. And the hope is that this could be, you know, give us some time, basically buy us some time to come up with a longer term solution uh, for that bridge. It is a very uh, popular trail. It was once actually a, uh, a crossing for um, farm equipment, um, but um, we lost that bridge some years ago. So anyway, the hope is that this buys us some many months and then we can come up with a, a larger plan that would likely, of course, require an NOI. So happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dave. Alex? I'm just curious if the failure is because we have a changing environment and uh, that couldn't have been, been anticipated when the design of the bridge was made? Um, well, the bridge didn't fail, actually, Alex. The, uh, the abutment caved in. So no doubt, um, I, I've been down there during some of these storms, as has Aaron, as has Brad. Um, this is a pinch point in the in the Hot Brook created by this historic farm crossing, no doubt about that. Um, and these two abutments, you know, we all hoped, I think they would last another hundred years, but they've been in there a long, long time. And I think in some of these very powerful flashy storms, water was able to get behind this the eastern abutment and literally cause it to slump into the river. So yeah. it's, it's it's probably 15, 18 feet long and uh, a combination of large stones and concrete. It's not going anywhere, but um, it's not the ideal um, environment to have that bridge be on for the next many years. So we've got to figure out a solution there. Thank you. Bruce. Is this the kind of thing for which we could get state grant support? Uh, anything's possible, I guess, Bruce. Um, I, I, yeah, anything's possible. I, I, I can't think of a grant funder right off the top of my head that would be interested in this project, unless, um, unless we, you know, we, we'd really need to look at this comprehensively, and we will, but. The long-term solution is to expand the pinch point and make this a much longer bridge and basically blow out what the what the farmers did a hundred years ago by pinching the the uh, the um, uh, floodplain of the of the hot brook there. Um, uh, Aaron, what would you estimate? Is it is it a ten foot uh, way through there? Ten. You mean the width of the, yeah, the access width. road? You or know, the width between the the existing uh it might be it might be yeah, 12, feet, it's a, 12 to 14 feet something like that yeah i mean i would estimate probably 20 feet width okay. but or less it, um it wants to be much it wants to be larger. much larger it was it was clearly a constructed berm um that was built a long time ago and it's actually i looked at the deed for that property and i believe it and I can't recall the exact name, but it's actually in the packets. It's, uh, I want to say it's called like Brickyard Way, an, an ancient way um, it's defined as in the deed, which is interesting. So it was like an ancient road um, that was located there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's all historic fill. We we would love to someday restore some of that area and and figure something else out, but it's it's a challenging location. And a very expensive fix, so... We'll 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 uh, sharpen our pencils and see if we can figure out a solution. Great. Okay. okay. Thanks. Um, if there's no other questions, we're looking for a motion to ratify the emergency certifications for Eastman Lane Road culvert repairs and stabilization of the Hot Brook pedestrian bridge on Southeast Street. 
Was that Alex on the motion? Yes. Yeah. Second. Bruce on the second. Rachel? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Aye. I'm an aye. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Um, minor modification? Yeah. Um, so I've been in contact with um, the the project at 1220 Belchtown Road, which is the old Michaels Billiards building. Um, it's the service net facility that we permitted back in 2022. Um, there is a very challenging outlet, which is a sump pump outlet um, that comes off of the building in proximity to the Faring Brook. And um, initially, when the outlet was installed, it was in the wrong location. So I reached out to them and said, it's in the wrong location. It needs to be relocated to its correct permitted location. Um, the original location was right behind the wing wall of the, um, the culvert. Um, and so it was basically the location that the commission said no to. So that's why I wanted them to move it back immediately. So they moved it back up onto the slope, but when they installed it, so it was so, sort of supposed to discharge parallel to the um, Perrin Brook, but on the top of the bank. And when they installed it, they put a um, an elbow on the end of the outlet pipe. So it basically directed it in a 90 degree um, down into the brook again, which caused more erosion. And so going back and forth with them, they were concerned just the location and it being at the top of the bank. So they suggested that they relocate it to discharge into the catch basin, which is a much preferred option, in my opinion, than having it discharge on the bank. So that is what the change is. Very minor, but I just wanted to make you aware of it. I don't even honestly think it requires your approval because it's significant improvement and much less impact. Um, but if the commission wants to make a motion to approve it, you're welcome to, or if you're just okay with the change, that that's fine too. Bruce. So my only concern is the email of uh, April 1st, I think it is, or April 2nd, where it goes on at some length from you saying that the final plan was not being followed, et cetera. And there was a lot of stuff and you gave him very little time to fix it. And, and all of a sudden it's a very simple thing. And I, I just wonder if there's more, more to it than that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I didn't realize that there was a big long forward on that email exchange. Um, the, the backstory on that is that the original pre-construction meeting happened in the fall and I met with the contractor and, um, um, some other folks on site back in the fall to, because they wanted to start work on the building. And so they had to post their DEP file number and, um, you know, kind of get approval to start. When we had that meeting, it was understood that the erosion controls weren't installed or inspected. And so in the fall, when earthwork began, they had to came, come back to me for a, an inspection. Um, and then I found out that work had started without an erosion control inspection and erosion controls had never been installed. And so when I found out about it, I went out and did an inspection and I gave them basically uh, about six hours to get erosion controls installed because it was in a really bad situation when I got out there. But they did correct that by the end of the day and installed erosion controls. So I was satisfied that that was resolved very quickly. Um, and so that is sort of the backstory on that. The the discharge pipe at the time when I was out there on that inspection was that's when I found it relocated behind the wing wall and it had no um, armoring whatsoever or erosion control around it. It was discharging directly to exposed soils behind the, the culvert um, uh, wing wall. And so I asked them to immediately armor it but that I told them that it needed to also be immediately relocated to the correct location. So they did relocate it within a matter of days to its correct location, but it was still causing issues. So like I said, I've been kind of in constant contact with them trying to get this matter resolved, but 
um, yeah, there's, this is a great example of how there's always stuff going on in the background with the commission. Like I'm, there's projects kicking off, there's work underway, I'm doing inspections, I'm having communications with applicants. I don't always share all of these details with the commission because it's just, there's so much going on, but frequently I do have these scenarios come up where I ask for immediate corrections and we go back and forth to have things resolved. Um, and only would I sort of bring it up if it was something that was um, egregious or like a serious violation, so. Well, fair enough, I just, the reason I brought it up is a concern that some contractor or contractors were not doing what was already agreed to in a somewhat significant way. Um, and I want to I want us to be supportive of what you and Dave are trying to do, but to see that they're just ignoring what you asked them to do in the fall is concerning. Yes, um, it was it was concerning, but I think we we've been able through kind of um, multiple meetings and discussions and right. site visits, uh, kind of get it addressed. So I think I think we're in a better place now. Thank you for your attention and rectifying that, Aaron. Go ahead, Bruce. And I'm also, in favor of a negotiative process, you know, over a number of meetings and discussions. That's all good. But anyway, yeah. I'm done. Or they could have just followed the plan from the start. So if anybody needs or feels the need to make a motion, please go ahead and do that. Um, I think we don't necessarily need it. Going once, going twice. Okay, let's move on. I think we are at 4, 7.30. So um, up to our first hearing. Okay, hearing one. Um, Aaron, I see some folks here for this one. Do you wanna bring them in while I read? Yes. So this is a notice of intent for Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Scott Toulet for the replacement of an existing 665 square foot barn with a 336 square foot shed within the buffer zone of bordering vegetated wetland at 172 Snell Street, Map 14C, Lot 95, 607 square feet of buffer zone and 518 square feet of bordering vegetated wetlands are proposed to be restored at the site. Okay, I'm gonna kick us and, off. Hi, and this one's Hi, opening, Hi. Michelle, just so you know. Oh, it is? Okay. Yes. This public hearing is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Okay, can you provide us our intro update, Erin? Yes. Um, I'm going to just pull up my slide. Give me a moment. Um, so uh, we had a site visit on Monday morning. Um, staff sort of thoughts on the project um, or background on the project are that um, Mr. Toule, um reached out to me back in 2023 to um, kind of express what uh, he was wishing to do on his property. Um, I gave him guidance, and um, based on my review of the materials, I believe that um, he followed staff recommendations that were offered back in 2023, and um, I believe that the project overall represents an improvement to existing conditions by reducing the existing structure on the property, moving it further away from the wetlands, um, also providing a significant mitigation area and returning a portion of his lawn to natural area. Again, um, just providing a uh, improvement to existing conditions. The one recommendation I did have was that in the proposed mitigation area, there was a pretty significant um, area of pachysandra that had um, been growing in a general area where the naturalized area is proposed to be. And so um, my request was basically that that pachysandra um, be removed from that location where the natural area is going to be located. Thanks, Erin. Um, I can't see the entire screen now, but let's see. Scott Ward, would you like to? Um, I just, five? I don't know if you have a copy of the um, screenshot of the site plan you could put up, Erin, just so sure. commissioners are aware. Um, 
basically the site has a uh, man-made dug channel that's an intermittent stream that was probably dug, who knows, a long time ago. It kind of goes through the lawn, uh, drains a wet meadow and a big off-site red maple wooded swamp. And part of the lawn is a buffer zone that's proposed to be mitigated. And part of it is um, actually wetland. If you look, you, there's the proposed um, shed. And you look up and right of that, that mowed area there is actually underlain by hydric soils. So that area is proposed to be returned to natural wetland conditions. Um, and the buffer zone to the east of the proposed shed, uh, the area identified there is proposed to be uh, returned to natural buffer zone conditions. Uh, we're proposing to plant the total of 11 wetland shrubs at the edge of the, the boundary of the mitigation areas to permanently demarcate them that they won't be mowed any longer. So it'd be three silky dogwood, four winterberry holly, and four spice bush would be planted in that area. And um, as Aaron recommended, and I spoke with Scott, and he agreed to remove the pachysandra within the mitigation area um, so that that's uh, not doesn't continue to spread. We had some uh, questions by one of the commissioners that Scott answered. I don't know if you had a chance to share that with the commissioner that asked the questions, Erin. Um, I think Rachel was copied on the answers um, to the questions, um, but I did not share them with the overall commission. So I don't know if somebody wants to okay. summarize any of that. Um, I'm gonna open it for public comment. So please raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, not immediately seeing any, so we'll go to Bruce. You're muted, Bruce. Yeah, I think I was the commissioner who was there. So, and it all, all the description so far comports with what I observed and what we talked about. Thanks, Bruce. Rachel? Yeah, great. I um I wasn't able to attend, but I did look at the plans closely and um agree. I think it's it's an improvement over the existing conditions. Um and I just want to the questions that I had asked were just to a little bit more detail and specificity to make sure that we're approving everything that you want to do um with related to the scope. And so the question was one, it you know, it, are you raising the elevation of the shed? And the answer is yes, I think about nine inches to a foot above grade. Right. Uh, yeah. A little bit of fill adjacent to that. Um, it sounds like it's extending 18 inches out from the building. So the footprint's a little bit bigger. Yeah, um, and that'll give a drip edge, you know, as well, because you asked about that. In yeah, terms and of erosion, asked about so. the stormwater coming off the roof and it's right, right. For erosion. So you're doing all the right things. Um, and then I'd also had asked about the, you know, what what's happening to the footprint of the barn, um, where the barn's being removed, if that would be scarified and what type of seeds and they answered a you know a perennial perennial rye, which is actually better for climate change um, and will handle drought and wet conditions. Um, so you answered all all my questions. All right, super. Great, thanks, guys. Um, all right. Well, I agree with everything. This is a improvement over existing conditions, and thank you for doing the restoration back to natural cover and removing that pachysandra. Um, Alex, I see you have a question, but you're muted. I have a question for Mr. Ward. It's just a general, general question. Um, what do you think about viburnum? Um, I have no problem with viburnum. I, there's been a, uh, I can't remember what it is, but it's a beetle that's kind of hitting them out in, uh, New York state. Uh, are you recommending viburnum instead of the species that I recommended? I didn't say that. Okay. I I have no problem with viburnum. Uh, dentatum, or is that what you're thinking? Arrowwood? Something like that. Something that provides berries. Um, yeah, I, I think the silky dogwood and the winterberry holly provide berries. If you, if you would like to get more diversity and um, change a couple of these for... Um, I, just, I, them, I have no problem with that. Just add some wildlife value, some more um, wildlife value. 
Yeah, diversity. Just maybe throw in a couple of viburnum into the mix. So if we knock the number of winterberry holly and spice bush down by one and added two viburnum. Great. Would that be good? Super. Sure. Do you need uh for the winterberry? Sorry, I don't know this exactly. Do you need male and female plants you for do. that? You do. Okay. Well, so yeah, you do to get uh, to get berries. So we would have three proposed. Okay. So Great. hopefully we would get at least one male and two females would be ideal. All right, sounds good. Any other questions? Okay, looking for a motion. Um, Aaron, do you mind pulling? Go ahead, Bruce. Yes. I move to issue the order of conditions EP number 089-0735 with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations with the noted additional conditions. Second. Bruce on the motion, Andre on the second. Rachel? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Good. All right. Thanks, Ward. Thanks. Thank you guys. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, next up we have Notice of intent for Karen Environmental Consulting LLC on behalf of LLS E Fornax LLC and WD Coles INC for the construction of a battery storage system associated access road improvements and stormwater management within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Montague Road, Route 63, Map 2A, Lot 16. All right, do we have anyone here for this one tonight? Yes, I added Jeff. Um, if there's anybody else for this project that I should let in, um, either raise your hand or Jeff, if you could let me know. It's just me and okay. um, yeah, just me for now. Okay. Hi, welcome. Um, okay, so we're looking to move this tonight. I mean, sorry, continue tonight. Um, and you are seeking feedback on the draft invasive species management plan. Is that what we're setting out to accomplish? Yeah, so I, I don't think we have the plan to submit. I, I We've received a proposal about the removal of the uh, invasive species, but we don't have a plan to submit yet. So I just wanted to follow up our meeting of yesterday and attend to see if there are any follow-up questions or concerns about the site walk. Sure, thanks. Um, so were you intending to submit a new or different invasive species management plan, or do you want some thoughts on the proposal that you've submitted already. It would be great to get your thoughts um, on that and we can iterate with Scott and Oxbow and, and you know, feed that back to them if there are some suggestions. Sure. Um, so Alex and I were out on the site is that just yesterday and we, um, great job on the staking, made it pretty easy to see what's going on there and took a walk on um, along the wetland. There's a little brook that feeds into the Eastman Brook. Is that right? It goes some way. Um, and I got a chance to look at the plants and sort of compared it to the invasive species management plan. So um, for those of you who haven't looked at it yet, the invasive species management plan is 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 big in size. It's about six plus acres, which is great. Um, it encompasses this this property and then the adjacent one, um, both owned by Coles. And it's the proposal from Oxbow was to do spraying. It was like 16 hours a year um, with a focus on certain species that they identified. So Alex and I were out there and we saw that it was a primarily, um, it was dominated by primarily native shrubs, a lot of alder and stuff with some herbaceous understory just because it seems to be grazed in the past or some kind of farmland. So it's it's not heavily impacted site currently. It's um it's kind of got a nice alder buffer along the stream. Um, so I we're considering building um in the fifty foot buffer and within the fifty foot no disturb, no build. So I have some considerations and recommendations um for that and 
specific to the invasive management plan. So some of these that I was thinking are, um, okay, so rather than having a 16 hour per year um, to have some kind of performance standard like 10% invasive cover. And when someone's out on site, they could sort of do the survey while they do their treatment. And to use that as a sort of a, a co-goal or a supersedence over the 16 hours, so whatever, whatever it takes to meet that. Um, so including cutting and treating stumps, if there are some bigger buckthorns on site, they're going to have to be cut and treated and removed and maybe include plantings. Um, if there's going to be a lot of shrub removal to keep the cover. And yeah, like I said, the annual survey, while well, people are on site with sort of a short report just on activities and what the, what the cover is looking like and that, let's see, this be done for the life of the project. Um, so those were my thoughts. Anyone else have any comments, mm -hmm. reflections? Alex, you were there. Any thoughts? Yeah, I do. Um, I'd like to know what, I don't think Jeff is the person to answer the question, but how much buckthorn do you think there is? It's a good question. We can certainly ask, um, ask, Chuck, Karen, and, and the Oxbow team from their survey, what they can quantify for us. Yeah, I mean, Alex, I didn't really, I saw like one buckthorn plant. Most of it was multiple rows for the invasive shrubs. But um, yeah, I guess I don't think I mentioned that to, to expand the non-native invasive species target list so that it's not just a couple, because once you treat some, something else may pop up over the life of the project. So to make it adaptive in that way. And so rather than list specific species, just because we never know it's gonna what it's going to look like in 15 years, um, just non-native invasive plants. Yeah. And so... Um, I went back with somebody who's pretty good at identifying shrubs and we walked uh, east from, you know, if you drew a line from the western side of the concrete pad down to the brook and then walk east to the stream that comes underneath the Eversource power line, we found one uh, buckthorn and um, um or maybe, wait a minute, I just looked at my notes, two or three buckthorn. Most of them are alders. And um, so I, I'm i with Michelle in terms of not being specific to buckthorn, but rather talking about uh, invasive or even non-native plants. And if there are a low density of them on the site, because the battery is the battery project is actually integrated into the solar it's all one project and i was going to propose if if the if the density of of the plants we want eliminated is light then go to all three parcels so that if you're planting uh, and i was going to suggest for buckthorn for example for every 10 that you put out, plant some, a couple of viburnums, and then give you a list of them so that we're putting back some of the cover um, and wildlife uh, food um, and, and building that up. And also there's a, the stream that goes underneath the Eversource power line is exposed to the sun and its radio and its, and its warming effect. Uh, I don't know if you could plant some of that uh, along that stream and still not get in the way of Eversource, but that would be a nice place to plant some stuff and uh, do some healing there. That was my, I didn't quite know where the boundary, where the parcel boundaries are. So uh, I just, uh, when I walked out today, it just, rather than we're putting a plant where you take a buckthorn out, find a place where it could really do some good. So I would, that's, that's the only changes that, that I thought of. And I sent that to Aaron and Michelle later earlier today, but uh, is to expand the parcel to all three to give opportunity to um, take non-natives off the entire project 
and give you the freedom to plant things where they could uh, improve conditions. And maybe when you bring back your plan, you could, if you're up for that, you could um, uh, talk about where you think planting would be good. Okay, so it, it sounds like you're the area you're talking about adding would be on the east side of Eastman Brook. Is that what you're suggesting? That side of the parcel. Well, uh, when I wrote this up, I just I didn't know where parcels were, so I just said uh, because the battery project is on one parcel, but there are three involved in the whole project, and the battery is integral to the whole pro to the solar project. So that's it's all one project. So I just said, consider all three parcels. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and based on the walk around, I didn't. It didn't look like invasives were um, uh, extensive. Mm -hmm. So I didn't. In terms of a mitigation package, um, it was sort of like the sleeves off my vest. Uh, if we didn't, if we didn't have a lot of invasive species um then if we expanded the area probably the cost wouldn't be that much more and uh, be more effective mm -hmm. yeah i mean it is invasive light currently and i don't even think it would take 16 hours if you're just spraying but if you're pulling and treating um maybe I'm, are you willing to sketch something up or explore the possibility of expanding onto the other parcels jeff does that sound like a possibility sure sure I, I i you know some of the area we mentioned the robert frost trails over on that eastern edge where if you're going to expand on the other parcel i'm just curious where the commission thinks that would be most beneficial um the immediate the area immediately adjacent to where the battery is is the Eastman Brook corridor there that we talked about, which has that wildlife corridor in it. Um, yeah, that's that's really nice. And so, you know, that seems like a good area to focus on. The Robert Frost Trail, which we talked about, which had been relocated further east of the solar, is another area to think about, which had a wetland buffer when we originally built the solar. So it's really far away. It's probably, you know, it, as the crow flies, it's probably like 1,500 feet to the east there. But I'm just trying to get some idea of what we want to suggest to Oxbow as to areas to think about, um, you know, whether contiguous is more beneficial or just since we're talking about adding that other parcel, what areas might be of interest to the commission? It's kind of hard to talk about this without a map in front of us sure. um well, for, for people who are walking the robert forest trail which is on the other end of the parcels uh, but still on the, the owner's land i think mm -hmm. um, there is a um there might be a visual benefit for planting shrubby tall shrubs but which, which wouldn't be a bother to ever source but create a visual barrier for people walking on the robert frost trail i know michelle has walked that trail and commented about it. I've walked that trail when, when frogs are chirping. <clears throat> and um, so that might be one area, but I, I didn't walk the site to answer the question that you've got in front of me now. Sure. And, and um, I'm, I mean, I'm, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, as a thought uh, exercise, but um, if I think Aaron's right on this here, um, If you, Can you sort of take your cursor, Aaron, and outline the okay, and then East Brook goes that way, and then to the east of your cursor, the wetland area is that the is that the part? Keep going east. Is that the part that you were talking about, which was near the solar installation, Jeff? Believe it or not, that part. It's, okay. Yeah, that, I'm talking about this right where Aaron was just showing. Okay. Way down wet area so i mean i i guess i'm just trying to think about what's going to be most beneficial yeah um my first inclination is contiguous as far mm -hmm. as you can do that so i think you know that would have some effect um kind of treat it like a management unit area um so maybe we can see something that encompasses a larger contiguous area on the three parcels sure. does that sound 
Yeah, as that, well, Alex? I can I can certainly take that back to um, to Oxbow and get their thoughts on what would be appropriate um, in continuing this um, beyond the six acres and for planting purposes and um, think about some ideal locations for plantings uh, to include viburnum. And, you know, some other species, too. It's pretty wet back there, so um, mm. there'll, there'll be a, a slew of things that you'll be able to put on that list. Uh, I can, great, I can, thanks. I can provide something through Aaron if you want something written that won't be real specific, but it would give you something to talk about. Sure, I think and clearly you, Alder is doing well. Yep. Yeah, alder's a successional plant, so something's going to come in there eventually. We don't know what that's going to be. Um, it can get pretty big. Viburnum. Okay. Um, so I think also tonight, uh, commissioners, we're looking for some input on whether or not, given this discussion and the further recommendations to the invasive management plan if we're willing to grant this waiver to the 50 foot no disturb and 75 foot no build. Um, it's not something we're gonna vote on tonight, but I think Jeff, you probably wanna know what our what our lean is on that one. Uh, go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I um, I visited the site on Sunday and thank you very much for staking that. That was really helpful to see um, where everything is. I, I looked at the um, full application in detail. I think I spent six hours um, pouring back and forth through things in detail. And um, um, just my comments to the commission is um, just wanna make you aware, there's a little bit of an inconsistency between the geotech report with how they characterize the soils and what the stormwater report characterized the soils as, which could lead to some problems down the road for both the wetlands and for the actual installation. Um, I think there the, Stormwater report is based on the NRCS data, which is you know, a GIS-based mapping system. And then the geotech report really dug holes and got in there and looked into at the actual soil. So the geotech report makes recommendations of construction methodologies, which were not incorporated in the drawings fully. If they are, then the footprint of the limit of work might expand, might expand into the riverfront area, might expand further into the wetland. Um, so those are things that could be fleshed out if the applicant is going back and looking at the plans. You know, that's something that they could review. Um, they could put the limited work line on the plans. They could look at the details and and, and weigh in which detail they're going to use. Either it's the engineer's detail or the geotech engineer. Um, also, I have questions about soil excavation. So the geotech was saying the soils are unsuitable for construction, as they are. Um, for both the road and the battery storage, and those are recommended to be removed um, and new soils placed that are structural and have bearing capacity. So in the past on some utility projects, those soils have been kept on site and they create the mounds like we saw upslope of the property, and that really can change the hydrology. So clarifying that soils, you know, they're going to be removed and what their plans are manage, manage that, managing that on site would be really helpful to the commission's review. Great, thank you, Rachel. Um, okay, Jeff, do you have you probably can't respond to that right away, but um, obviously they would be important for us evaluating the footprint again, mm -hmm. possibly. Okay. My my understanding though is, I mean, we would probably look for a balanced site um, if it was possible to use the spoils from these soils on site on areas like any of the um, existing. Um, impervious surfaces, uh, you know, there's some areas we may want to repair or top coat, we may be able to, to use those with some other aggregate on site rather than export them. Um, our goal would not be to change the hydrology on site. So if any structural soils are brought on, um, we likely would use those as a base material for the footprint of the pad here. Um, and so um, it will, I'll have to get more information from our, our civil engineers about that and, and circle back. Yes, yeah, great. Yeah, they were, there's, I mean, every every yeah. paragraph was like, soils are not good, basically, danger, danger, danger. Excavate five feet out from the footprint, excavate down really deep. So there's going to be a lot of soil volume movement on the site for this. 
Okay, and that might actually extend it further into the 50 foot buffer you're saying. And the river right. area, yeah, because the right edge. Could the, could, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Go ahead, Alex. Instead of going towards the wetland, because uh, then we get into um, the corridor and closer to the stream, could the design of the pad and the fence be elongated and, uh, and still serve your same purpose? That is a possibility. We'll have to, as as we mentioned on site, this is a maximum build size. So this is um, the equipment we're looking at ordering will likely fit in a smaller footprint than this. So um, it, when we first designed this, we designed this with what was available in the marketplace and some time has passed since then. So we think our footprint may shrink a little. So it's likely that we'll be able to shrink the footprint um, or reconfigure it. Um, so it's something that we could explore, um, but I would have to talk to, again, our civil engineer and just understand from his perspective what the what the best layout would be. Yes, yeah, so before Laura speaks, I just want to clarify that the fence, everything's going to be inside the fence. And I was just wondering if the, um, um, if the fence could be more rectangular than square and and deal with this the the soil issue and not encroach anymore on the on into the 30 foot buffer that's all mm -hmm. um just change the shape and and the second part of the question is if the and this could go to commissioners too if we spread the soil out that's being removed i assume it can be planted and put to good use i i, I don't know what the answer to that is i assume the answer is yes but I would ask those who know more than I do. Um, I think we can leave that to the um, Oxbow professionals, whether or not that would be suitable. It didn't look like great soil when we were out there. It was pretty sandy. <laughs> um, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, no, my question was, so it sounds as though you all will be looking to redesign anyways based on availability of equipment. Um, Where did you go? Let me see. There you are. Um, Jeff, um, in the redesign, do you expect that you're still going to be inside well within that 50 foot, um, buffer or excuse me, no build? We do. I think, uh, as technologies change, we keep shrinking the footprints of these. So we think we'll, we'll gain some square footage. Um, the background on this project is this is designed with the, the original project, um, and we can get the new generation uh, equipment that has a slightly smaller footprint. Um, and in that sense, we would be able to shrink the existing footprint and pull that fence line back or slightly reconfigure to try to move off of the buffer's edge. Okay, when do you suppose, because I think what, you know, we're not gonna vote tonight, but you know, if you, it, it's it's, you know, if you're not building within that 50 foot, no disturb, it's obviously a very different conversation than if you are. And and I can't answer that question. I'm not sure we have enough room to pull out entirely. So I, I would have to, okay. I'm not sure that okay. we can get 50 foot. Um, so um, that's, that's maybe a bridge too far, but I can, I can certainly explore a little more. Just, just for Laura's sake there, they can't build in the Eversource right away. Uh, they're right up against it. So uh, they, they don't have much leeway. Uh, if somebody yeah. has some background noise, they yeah, might all just on. mute. Uh, How about everybody who's not talking at the time mute, please? Okay. okay. Um, so Rachel, that, I, I'm sorry. Right. Good. No, no, okay. Go uh, Rachel, you're next. Um, also, if you're talking with your stormwater engineer, he's claiming some exemptions um, with the stormwater uh, regulations that do not apply if you're in the 50 foot buffer zone of a wetland. And if you are um, dealing with silty soils that are really classified as class C. So if he could look at that in detail also, I think that'd be important. Okay. 
So let me just make sure I get that right. So he's claiming some exemptions and this classy soil types may not afford us those exemptions. So just reevaluate. Right. right. His the NRCS calls them class B, but the geotech report calls them class C. Okay. Jason. Yeah, I just was gonna ask about the length of the road, and I think it was Alex that brought up the Eversource um right of way looking in the packet that we have and looking at previous maps that we looked at for this project i don't see that where that's marked on here um could that road potentially be shortened the access road be shortened and the whole area bumped up or to the kind of northeast or northwest um, where just where is that where is that ever source right away? Uh, Aaron, do you have the map handy? It it's on it. There's some topography here too to consider. Um, yeah. And I think you know, there's a. It says electric easement. I'm assuming that's it. Yeah. So the easement's right in this location, Jason. You can see this this line cutting through the site here. Yeah. Um, so the access road comes in off Montague and comes down and actually under the um, utility line. And then um, you can see on this page, it's um, it's north of the utility line. So the, the facility is actually proposed right up to the edge of the Eversource right-of-way, which is demarcated here, the width of it. This is a, it's a pretty major transmission line corridor. Yep. Okay. So you can't go any further north. No. Okay. All right. That was my only question. Thank you. Thanks. Laura? I guess my question, Michelle, is we're asking for a lot of, um, you know, more additional work on their end. And, I, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, I, I personally, you know, I know we revised the bylaws, so I was getting confused last time about whether we had partially approved something and I know we didn't and not last time a couple of meetings ago and we didn't and um you know I personally am not in favor of building within that 50 foot no disturb um and I don't want to have lodestar spin their wheels um you know I just I, I don't know what the process is so that's you know perhaps it can be redesigned um in a way that's more favorable but um I would just hate to have weeks pass by where they're answering all of our questions. And then the answer is no, ultimately no. So. Thanks, Laura. Um, I was going to, because since I mentioned that we would be trying to give you some inclination tonight, but we've also come up with a lot of other questions about the design, some of which may reduce the footprint possibly, some of which may increase the footprint. Um, so, I mean, I, would be interested in you guys coming back with something that um, answers some of those questions. But commissioners, if, if anyone is feeling strongly one way or the other, um, you know, as per Laura's statement, please, you know, voice that now. Um, otherwise, I would entertain um, some revisions and uh, plans that sort of address all of these things raised tonight. Okay, and if there's any public comment, please just raise your hand before we move on. Okay. Um, Alex, go ahead. You're muted, Alex. Just for commission information, I've raised the fire truck access issue a couple of times, and that got clarified during the um, site visit and the answer to the fire truck uh, access is that it would it would not alter the site anymore because they would use the Eversource uh, road, the, the service road, and the fire truck would not leave the Eversource um, service road and would be able to turn around there. Uh, Chris Bascom would have to approve that. But the answer that Jeff gave us when we were there is that no alteration of the site would take place to accommodate the fire truck. It's already there. And that was news to me. Um, 
And I appreciated that. And I also want to say thank you for the marvelous staking job. They really did a good job. It's a complicated site and uh, they made it easy. Thank you. I, I have, and to address Laura, I was also very sensitive to the 50 foot buffer and so on and so forth. Um, as I've learned more about this project and how squeezed in they are with the Eversource uh, constraint and um, um, although it has nothing to do with our jurisdiction or how we make a decision, I, I, and Laura knows more about this than I do, but the solar project serves a different need with the battery storage than it does by itself. And, um, and the battery thing, I thought it was separate and apart from the solar. It is not. The solar will charge the batteries um, and then discharge into the grid, um, uh, you know, at another time. So they are one project. And um, that that kind of changed my mind in terms of, could we have a mitigation package that was um, um, uh, robust enough to uh, allow to have a straight face in approving it. And to me, and I was pretty strong, I uh, had pretty strong feelings about this project and where it was, but if we could, if they can redesign it a little bit and lessen its impact and have a robust uh, mitigation plan that includes all three parcels, I could soften my point of view. Thanks, Alex. And Jeff, just as you're going back to the drawing board on the um, potential invasive management zone, like seeing something that improves conditions over a large area and thinking about wildlife corridors, um, that would be something that I'd love to see because currently the area of impact is pretty native and in pretty good condition and serving a purpose. So um, I guess expanding the reach for you know, showing some greater good there would be of interest. Okay, any last comments, commissioners? Okay, um, with that, we're looking for a motion to continue. Um, we don't have to open it up for public comment, Michelle, do we? Or at the very I, end? I, I have um, asked for a raised hand several times and I'm seeing none, so. Okay, um, I'll make a motion. Um, to continue the public hearing for the Monahue Road Battery Storage Project, DEP 0890731 to May 8th, 2024 at 7.45 p.m. Second. We're on the motion, Andre, on the second. Rachel? Abstain. Andre? Aye. Jason? I, but I'm not sure if I can vote on that. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not keeping track of all of the... <laughs> I'll, I'll abstain from this one. Okay. Uh, Laura? Aye. Bruce? Alex? Aye. No, I'm an aye. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Nice. Have a great Thanks for being there yesterday. Great. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, next up, abbreviated notice of resource delineation, SWCA environmental consultants on behalf of Amherst College for the confirmation of resource area boundaries of bordering vegetated wetlands and bank on a portion of 0 and 151 College Street map 14B and lot 14D. That's 165 and one encompassing approximately 4.1 acres. All right, Erin, want to give us an update on this one? Yes. Um, so the applicant did provide um, an updated uh, figure for us um, immediately following the um, April 10th meeting, uh, which added the limits to the study area. Um, uh, kind of where I'm standing with this one is that I um, am in favor of the commission issuing an ORAD um, based on the delineation we have before us. Um, 
However, I was hoping that we could close the public hearing tonight to allow me some additional time to craft the finding of fact so that we could be prepared to issue this on um, May 8th. If the applicant is is OK with that, then um, otherwise we should keep the public hearing open until the 8th. But um, if commissioners don't have any further concerns, um, I would be in favor of closing the hearing. There are a couple um, in the PowerPoint, a couple findings of fact that I wanted to make sure that I highlighted. Um, so I noted those in the PowerPoint, but uh, I could certainly review those if you'd like. Thanks, Erin. Um, I see Meredith and Darren. Do um, you guys want to take five? Sure. Hi, everyone. Meredith Bornstein, SWCA. Um, I can show everyone the plan that we resubmitted. Um, I never heard back if that was satisfactory, um, but I assumed it was. Um, we just added a study area after our site walk with Aaron and Alex and Rachel. Um, we had updated some flagging. And we, I showed that at the last meeting. And then we just added a study area of like, zooming into the exact um, area that we were hoping to get approved with this ANRAD. Um, I can show the commission if you'd like, or I don't know if Darren wants to say anything. He's here from um, Amherst College too. No, I mean, I, I saw the exhibit you submitted. It looked really good. And thought we had a very thorough site walk and good participation. Um, thought there was good consensus and collaboration throughout on the flags that were moved. And it sounded like, um, just because of the not having submitted something before that Wednesday, we were coming back tonight. And so Aaron, I'm not, would you mind just kind of re-explaining what you were, I mean, it sounded good. I just don't think I quite yeah. picked up the first time. Yeah, so um, when we issue a permit, we there's two parts. So we close the public hearing, which is the, the part where we, you know, take testimony from the applicant and also from the public um, to, it basically brings us to plan revisions and changes, et cetera. Um, and so because I'm satisfied with the plans that have been submitted to us, and I believe that we're ready to issue an order of resource area delineation at this point, I would be um, in favor of closing the public hearing this evening because I believe we have all the plans that we need to do that. It's just that the finding of fact has not been finalized yet. So um, and the finding of fact details certain things about the plan. So um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about anything extensive. Um, so just to give you a couple examples, um, we had discussed in the field that the, the BVW that's on the north side of the Fairing Brook was not delineated as part of this ORAD. And so that's one of the findings that would be in the finding of fact. And then also, um, flagging that's south of the W2 wetland, um, and I specifically demarcated the two flags, um, were not delineated beyond that boundary. So it's basically the limit of the study area. Um, but it was clear that the wetland continued to the south and um, the same with wetland W1. So it's basically just indicating we know that those wetlands continue to the south, but they're not... Um, delineated and we haven't reviewed those or studied those so it's just making that clear because like in the study area there's a gap between the wetland boundary and the study area and so um, but the polygons aren't closed right so potentially mm -hmm. um, you know they extend further to the south so right. um, relatively simple no that all sounds good um, notes number one where it talks about to the south um, I, I know exactly the area you're talking about. It's completely not impactful to um, the, the previously developed areas on our campus. Um, I just wouldn't want that to be misunderstood. I mean, because it could be taken as something like proximal to the curb line, for instance, of the parking lot. Um, but otherwise, it makes perfect sense. Um. So I'm just going to pull up the plan really quickly so I can show you because I think it'll um, make a little more sense if I show you. Yeah, that would be okay. for me because I'm trying to. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we have the all the flags on there that 
our relatives who like where they're working. Yeah. No, you, um, you, all of your, your, so like, like the, are there. Yeah. So do you see the, um, we I'm going to zoom. Screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Hold on. Bear with me one second. Okay. So what I'm talking about, so W2 is a good example. Um, so do you see how there's a line here indicating this is the limit of the wetland on the um, parking area side? But what I'm indicating is we know that the wetland continues in this direction. So it continues to the south. And so, because typically the study area boundary would sort of match that line to say we're not studying beyond here. Um, and so the finding of fact would just state this area was not confirmed um, behind the W2 wetland boundary. And similarly, um, and I know that this is, like I said, these are these are very minor, but I just want to make sure this is noted like 149. That's not where the wetland stops. The wetland mm -hmm. continues. Um, it's just the limit of the study area. So it's just to say nothing beyond flag 149, nothing beyond flag what is it? 100R and 110 has been has been included as part of the the ORAD. That makes sense. Um, and similarly, like um, the other the other finding was um, this: uh, the wetlands on the north side of the Farring Brook weren't delineated. They're not really relevant to the project. They're not going to impact your buffer zones um, because they're only going to impact on this side of the road. But just to note that those were not studied or confirmed. Well, it makes sense. It helps to see it with the exhibit. And I know in your findings, they'll be combined, right? So it yes. makes walking through it. Yep. Okay. So you guys clear on that? Okay. Commissioners, any questions? And if there's any public comment, please raise your hand now. Okay. I'm seeing none from anyone. Um, we're looking for a motion to close the public hearing for Amherst College and RAD DEP number 089-0734. I move. I so moved. I'll second. Alex on the motion. Laura on the second. Laura? Aye. Andre? Aye. Jason? I abstain. Alex? Aye. Uh, Rachel? Aye. And I'm an I. Did I get everyone? Okay. All right, Bruce. Bruce, <laughs> you're an I. <laughs> There's a lot of people to scroll through tonight. Sorry. Okay. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did Rachel abstain on that? That's what I heard. Is that true? Thank you. And I thought Jason was, did Jason have seen? Yes, he did. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. Thanks, Darren and Meredith. Have a good one. Thank you, Darren. Okay. And um, I think there's another, I might hang around and listen to another part of it. Okay. Okay. I'll just take you off our panel and put you back in the in the audience Good night. all right next up um berkshire design group on behalf of the emily dickinson museum for the construction of a historic carriage house and associated site work in the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at 214 main street map 14b lot 26 and i saw chris there it is yeah, and I don't know if anybody um raise your hand if you're here for this. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jane Wald should be on the meeting from the museum and um she should be admitted as panelists if that's possible. Got it. Hey Chris. All right. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, Hello. Jane. Okay. Um so we were out on a site visit this past week. Aaron, do you want to? provide an update for this one. You're on mute. Sorry, I don't see Jane on the on the call, but if if she I, is I, I added she's Jane in already. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Michelle must have gone her Beat before. I... Yeah. Okay. Um 
So we held a, a follow-up site visit on April 22nd. Um, uh, just as a follow-up, there's a, a waiver required for this project for the 50-foot no disturb and the 75-foot no build. Um, there were additional comments and suggestions made at the site visit, including um, adding snow fencing around the native vegetation to prevent construction disturbance of the berm, um, preserving native vegetation on the site um, to the degree possible, uh, naturalizing a portion of the lawn area as additional mitigation, and again, not to um, allow it for succession purposes, but more so to like leave, um, to not leaf blow it and not mow it, just to leave it for um, sort of in its natural state. Remove barbed wire fencing. Um, and then there was a discussion about uh, Japanese lilac that was um, discovered on the site or, or um, identified on the site. So there was some discussion about that. And um, I think it was, there was there was sort of some discussion around all of this and it was that we were going to sort of regroup and um, come together to figure out what uh, what the proposal ultimately would be. Yeah, thanks, Erin. And just to add to that, um, we were out there with Chris and we, you know, sort of did a slight survey of the site and um, saw that there the wetland that had been delineated is pretty much overtaken with this Japanese uh, lilac and just looking at the sort of the source of those seeds, which is um, some mature of that plant and sort of overhanging into the wetland area. And so we, we talked about ways to if that would be a mitigation area, how to best approach that. Um, and so I think we gave Chris some thoughts on it. So if you guys want to take five minutes, um, we'd love to hear about sure. yours. Yeah, um, that, that was a good summary. Um, and I think um, for the most part, a lot of the comments uh, that came out at the site visit, um, the museum is going to be able to accommodate and will be able to incorporate into the final plan. Um, I'll tick through them quickly. Um, the, the snow fence protection, absolutely, um, uh, we can, we'll incorporate that. Um, there, uh, what wasn't mentioned there, um, I think Bruce had identified there's some barbed wire fence along the back that's sort of practically in the wetland that we'll also remove, we'll add those minor things to the plan. Um, the big one is the, um, the Japanese tree lilac. Um, there is a, a fair amount of that tree lilac on the site. It was actually one of the favored plants by the Dickinson family, so that's why there is so much of it. Um, in looking, uh, did some research on that species in particular, and while it's not listed as an invasive, um, it is being considered for monitoring in both Vermont and New York, um, which has seen isolated pockets of this similar situation where the seeds are getting into a natural area and coming to dominate. Um, it, uh, based on what I've found, uh, the seeds are relatively heavy and don't get wind blown. And so that's why this isn't often seen as a problematic plant, that it's often in the center of a landscape. And as long as it's mowed around, there's no vegetative spread, the seeds can't go very far and it stays contained. But in these situations, we've got a mature tree throwing off lots of seeds into a naturalized area, exactly like what we've got that's happening. Um, so as long as we're talking about limiting it to the um, area close into the wetlands um, and not some of the more distant areas where there uh, may be tree lilacs on site, the museum um, is uh, happy to commit to cutting the mature uh, lilac trees that are contributing to the to the seeds there, um, and then um, because the uh, it takes three or four years for those plants to even start seeding, and it's really the mature trees that are a problem. We feel really good that if we get in there um, and remove the younger plants, um, and you know our proposal for the mitigation in general was uh, one year of removal followed by a couple of years of maintenance, um, that we should really be able to knock that population down quite a bit um, and allow the, the native vegetation to come back in. Um, so we're absolutely uh, happy to commit to that as, as part of this process. Um, additionally, um, leaving the corner of the site uh, that we've identified there, um, to to allow the leaf litter to move in and sort of renaturalize the ground cover um, as long as the museum still has the ability at least once a year to go in um, and prevent sort of the, the succession plants from starting to uh, creep into that area. Um, they can absolutely 
uh, commit to that. And we were talking about the uh, question of delineating that area, which is something that came up in Aaron's comments originally and was discussed a little bit on site um, and a, a little bit of a, of a creative solution that Jane and I were talking about earlier. Since we'll be cutting trees in that area, um, might it make sense to propose a line of three or four trees to be planted in that location. Um, we, they could be tagged as they're already tagged trees on the museum property to identify them, um, but in a, a, a clear uh, line of uh, a native species that's historically appropriate to the site to try to uh, delineate that without sort of an artificial or modern um, uh, aesthetic uh, in terms of uh, dictating where that line is going to be. Um, there were also some comments uh, that didn't get mentioned uh, about the particular shrub uh, and native planting selection. Um, there was a suggestion that instead of the blueberry uh, that had been proposed as native shrub plantings um, to potentially consider uh, an appropriate species of viburnum in that area. Um, and the museum certainly open to that, um, and that's a little bit more of a substantial shrub that will uh, um, hopefully crowd out the tree lilac that may remain uh, and sneak through our, our mitigation efforts. Um, and as long as that, uh, the, the one thing we would say is that as long as that's um, contained to sort of what's on really the Amherst College land, in the currently wooded, heavily vegetated, brushy areas. Since that's not part of the historic aesthetic of the site, we wouldn't want to see that um, further out into sort of the more formal portions of the site. Um, and then the, the one last thing that I want to add, there's uh, been just some uh, uh, comments uh, about the building location, and that actually is fundamental to a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, I know I mentioned a little bit, uh, just really scratching the surface on the process that we went through in terms of locating the building where it is, which is quite close to the resource area. Um, and I think Jane would just like to, to explain a little bit of the background there because uh, it's not a decision that was made lightly and there's quite a lot of research thought and also um, regulatory guidance that went into that. Into what? into locating the building where it's proposed on the plan oh, and that that specific location um as shown yeah i was going to bring that up there's it's also first. if i when when it's time for commissioners i have a something that we talked about that you didn't discuss so i'll come back to that when it's our turn sure great um aaron do you mind pulling up the map of the site um and, you know, just to summarize this a little further, this is um, building in the 50 foot no disturb, and this is the drain pipe, the stormwater drain pipe that's going to be um, dug through the 50 foot. Am I getting that right? And so sewer, sewer, uh, and so, yes, yes, yeah, sorry. The reason that it's not going to be outside of the 50 foot is because the area hasn't been dug before and that you're trying to avoid the historical survey that would have be necessitated by disturbing the dirt. So right. even though there is an alternative to being inside the 50 foot, that that's what they're proposing. So that's for the commissioners to understand that there is a viable alternative, but they're asking to put it in the 50 foot and this is the mitigation that's being proposed. And Aaron, can you kind of zoom in on yes. the building area and the berm? Um, yeah, so I guess I was confused last meeting because I guess the way that historical folks talk about disturbance is different than the way ecological folks talk about disturbance. So outside the 50 foot is heavily disturbed and non-native, you know, and now invasive in this context, um, but just not historically or disturbed in modern times to necessitate historical survey. Um, okay, and so the hash marked is the proposed mitigation treatment area. And that's basically a berm that's sort of sheltering a wetland behind it. And if um, I don't know if you have lo like recent pictures, but this is pretty much a solid cover of these plants, um, the progeny of these trees that's to the east of it. Um, overhanging and dropping into the into the wetland area. So um, thank you for considering all of our comments and it's great, you know, what you're saying is great. I guess one thing that I, a couple things is 
um, just given that there's probably other seeds in the seed bank, um, I think maybe extending that one year treatment period to maybe two or three would be useful. I know you said maintenance following the one year, but you know, I don't know what the life history of that tree is. And so it might take more than one year of pulling and spraying to get it back down. Um, and then we had talked about, I think in the original plan, there was something about some species were identified to focus on. So I think we've already you know, determined that there's other species that should be added to that list. But I think just expanding the target species to just be any non-native invasive plant. Um, and yeah, so that's the ground that we were suggesting would be sort of leave the leaves situation. Um, it's just leaf blown um to the dirt and it's also functioning as a pathway up to that fraternity um so there's a lot of sort of disturbance to the ground going on um so some other thoughts i had were expanding the treatment area into the wetland instead of just the berm um if we can go back to the map Yeah, so I mean, th this is really just sort of a swamp right here, all the way up to that A19 and over to the A23. And just focusing ex on that. Ex excuse me, um, could you, uh, with a cursor or some kind of um, yeah, delineation, identify the area you're talking about? Yeah, and maybe you zoom in just a bit, Erin. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that is the extent of this wet area. So it's basically a an island of a wetland, but still um, supporting some native species up on that north end. And the place closest to the Emily Dickinson house is mostly overrun with that um, Japanese lilac. So that was just one suggestion I had, because if you stop short at that line, I mean, the rest of the site is just going to become overgrown with invasives and continually reseed into that berm. Um, so it makes sense to treat it as sort of an, a single area because it's all connected. Um, and then the other thing is we talked about on this site walk with Alex having this be for the life of the project so that uh, it's just maintained in perpetuity or whatever the life of that building is as a naturalized area. So those are my thoughts on this. Um, commissioner's comments. Bruce. Uh, so um, the added piece for me would be that the, the wonderful uh, carpet of uh, trout lilies that are there now, which we had a hard time not stepping on, um, be identified and delineated so you can try to avoid digging them up. <laughs> and try to avoid compacting them so that they don't come back. And it's they're really obvious right now, but they won't be in another, what, a month or so. You won't be able to tell very easily. So I would get out there and put some markers around it so that it's at least try to not disturb them. And and just to clarify, you're, you're talking about um, inadvertent disturbance while we're doing this mitigation work? It's possible. I mean, I get that there's it's, it's a constrained site. But you were there, you saw the difficulties. We kept trying to not step on them and they're all, it's wonderful, but it won't be if that all gets dug up. Well, particularly because there's a sewer line that's proposed to run in that location where the trout lily was located. So if there's any way during, I mean, I'm, I assume that because this site is sensitive that when the excavation is done, there's gonna be some sort of, um, uh, careful excavation of that area to lay down the sewer line. And so I think another sort of potential condition that could be um, incorporated here is to try to save the soils where the trout lily is growing so that they can be placed back once the sewer line is la laid down. I mean, it's just an idea. Yeah, um, cer certainly. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm sure there are experts you could confer with about how easy that is to do to take them somewhere, keep them, and then put them back. I don't know, but. Yeah, and certainly there's um, there's going to be, this came up, uh, I think we were talking with Alex, um, that the 
the straight run of the sewer from the building to the corner of the property where we need to stay just outside the museum property to avoid the archaeological study is pretty much set. From there, um, you know, the the route is flexible as long as we get up to the Marsh Hall connection. Um, and so one thing that Alex had highlighted that that we were already thinking about is marking that exact route out in the field prior to any work being done um, so that we can stay away from larger trees um, and certainly avoiding uh, communities like like the trout lily um, to the extent we possibly can. We certainly will um, yep. already have plans to be doing that as part of the construction process to ensure that that pipe can go where it needs to. The pipe can bend, it's a force main, it can bend, it can go around uh, certain areas and, and really be put wherever we want. And uh, it's a two inch pipe that, that needs a very narrow trench. Thanks, Chris. Alex? Yeah, if Erin uh, can bring up the photo that she had that looks up that hill, um, that's the best I can, it was a broad view looking up the hill, not the plan, but the photo. Yeah, it's almost. almost. Yeah, that one. So, um, you can't see the big trees up there, but you can see what Chris was talking about. Um, well, you, nobody can tell where the marker is up there, but there is a way to take an angle and avoid a lot of those trout lilies and go up um, between the trees. Um, but the other thing I, and so that's all I'll say about that. But there, the other thing I wanted to bring up is there is, that's the stake. Okay, there is a drain pipe coming from the fraternity house that comes right down that hill, and it it the water comes down to the building site. And Chris and I talked about maybe having the college reroute that so water doesn't come down um, in back of the building because that's going to be a construction problem for you. And yeah. So Jane that. Jane's nodding her head. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, I just wanted to, Chris didn't bring it up, so I wanted to make sure I brought it up. And uh, I don't know if the trout lilies are depending on that. If it's, um, it's not sewer, it's it's some sort of drain. Yeah, my, uh, it's based on the way it's laid out and the elevation and the fact that there are multiple of them. I'm almost certain that that's foundation drainage from the building. Okay, so I just wanted to bring up that that source of water m might be a good thing to reroute someplace and then uh, i i'm the one who brought up the location of the building and could it be moved over 10 feet to save that tr tree and i think i just saw jane quiver so <laughs> i'm sure she'll address it yeah go ahead jane yes thanks um so this uh, the water drainage down toward this site is uh, of historic and almost monumental proportions. <laughs> um, uh, the Evergreens, the, the, the 1856 house, um, had so much water drainage into it that it had um, it had like a little stream running through it from east to west to uh, convey the water out of that out of the cellar because of the runoff and the high water table uh, on that site. Uh, so the Emily Dickinson Museum has done quite a bit of work to um, to mitigate the that kind of water intrusion. Uh, that does not entirely address Alex's point. Uh, but I, I, I think what I, you know, what I want to say is that um, th this whole site uh, has historically been subject to, uh, to, to this kind of water intrusion. 
we we have found archaeologically we found clay pipes that have tried to convey water in various directions um we ourselves have taken m- many significant efforts to uh to mitigate the water that goes goes under the house because that creates a a, a just a terrible environment for for the house itself and for the collections within it so that's just one point I want to make. Um, the other thing about the siding of uh, the siding of the carriage house itself, um, as a historic site, um, you know we've we've got some other sort of regulatory things we need to be cognizant of, and one is um, the uh, uh, Secretary of the Interiors standards for uh, preservation. Um, So under the National Preservation Act, and this is way back in 1966, um, the Secretary of the Interior is responsible for establishing professional standards and providing guidance on the preservation of the nation's historic properties. And so both the homestead and the evergreens are counted among the nation's historic properties. Um, So the evergreens and its grounds are subject to um, National Park Service regulations known as Section 106. Um, In addition, the Massachusetts Historical Commission uh, has a preservation restriction on the evergreens historic structure and the and the grounds and the property. So whatever we do uh, uh, respect uh, with regard to the house and the grounds needs to be approved by the Massachusetts Historic Commission. Uh, and you know, in addition to that, the local historic district commission has a role to play in approving our plans so we've got we've got a kind of a number of historical agency regulations both at the federal level the state level and the local level on you know what will be acceptable so we've been through the approval processes with each of these agencies up to now and they've approved the plans that we've put in, you know, the plans that you've reviewed. Um, each of these agencies has uh, approved those plans. Um, so one other like little tidbit of the, like the nerdy historic preservation uh, landscape is that the secretary of, this is the United States Secretary of the Interior uh, has issued standards for the treatment of historic properties that apply to all projects um, assisted through a historic preservation fund, which includes Save America's Treasures. And so all of those standards apply to the evergreens. Uh, and those standards address four different authorized treatments, and those are preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. Um, And all of these treatment standards were codified in national legislation in uh, in the mid nineties. So what we're trying to do here at the Evergreens is reconstruction. And reconstruction is, um, in, a way, it, it, in a way, it's the least common of those four treatments because it's the most difficult to achieve. Yet, um, there are clear standards um, which, we've, which we've already met. And part of those standards is the siting of a reconstruction. And so the, the Evergreen's carriage house um, has already clearly qualified um, according to these different, you know, local, uh, state, and national uh, agencies. It's already qualified as a reconstruction. Jane, and I think we, we, sorry to interrupt you. I just, we need to keep moving it. <laughs> it is all right. very interesting. Okay. Um, you are obviously in a lot of um, jurisdictional 
um, nexuses here with uh, state and local wetlands laws in addition to the historical. So I think you gave us a pretty good well, understanding of the, the building placement, um, but I think we need to move on with well, our other very, hearings. Okay, very good. That, that is what I was trying to convey to you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, Michelle, I do have a question. I was waiting for her yeah. to finish. Um, right. And if there's any public comment, please raise your hand now and I'll get to you. Alec, Alex, go ahead. Was there a bathroom in the carriage house? Uh, in the 19th century carriage house, there was not a bathroom, but according to the national, to the secretariat, wait, according to the secretary of interior standards, the standards apply to the exterior appearance of, of the, of the structure, the right. interior can serve other functions. Okay, so you're building a visitor center to look like a carriage house. No, we are building a carriage house that will serve other other functions. It will be, at first it can be uh, used as a visitor center. Ultimately, it will be used as a program and education space. Okay, I think this but, is sort of so beyond that, our jurisdiction, those are, those Alex. Are, right, I, well, I, I have a point to make. I, I mean, I understand where you're going um, with it, but I, I think since we are going to move to continue this public hearing tonight, I just want to make sure that Chris and Jane have heard our recommendations about what we'd like to see with the mitigation. And was all that clear? Did you get it down? Do you need some further correspondence from us? Um, we had just some additions to what we discussed or what um, Chris said, and I do appreciate you addressing those things that we discussed in the field. Um, Laura, go yeah. ahead. I've been making notes, um, so I believe I have all of the pieces of it, but I'll, I'll follow up with Erin to make yeah, sure that, uh, that she Thank and I are on the same page. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, Michelle, I, I, Wait, I, hold on, Laura hasn't talked yet. Go ahead, Laura. I, I just have one question. In the very beginning, Michelle, tell me if I heard this correctly. Did you say, that this they were intending on building within the 50 foot no build so Not, there the, no disturb area the sewer line is going to be trenched the, through the 50 foot no disturb area the and structure the, is the building also is as well the, the, structure the entire is building well. is inside it i'll pull the plan up so you can see it again but yes the structure and the sewer line work so even there's temporary there are, there are alter, even though there's alternatives to putting it within the 50 foot no disturb so I did mention the alternative to trenching in the 50 foot. And then um, we just heard an explanation of the historical constraints on the siting of the building. Uh, yeah, I heard it. Yeah. Okay. So the 50 foot follows my cursor. Um, so the majority of the structure itself is located within the 50 foot no build. Can you draw a line, please? Uh, yeah, I don't know why. Hold on, bear with me just a second. I <laughs> my <laughs> screen is not cooperating. Yes, um, the fifty foot line comes like this, mm -hmm. and the the wetland is okay. located up here. Yes, so that is what we are considering, Jason. Yes, yeah, sorry. I I know you you mentioned that there were some constraints, um, and there are alternatives to the force main. Or is there? I'm not sure if I understand what the constraints are, but why can't it just go down the driveway to? There's no sewer line out there. There's no sewer in Main Street, so you have to force main it up to where we're going to connect it to the sewer that leaves Amherst College's Marsh Hall, which is on the property directly north at the top of the hill. Um, and from there, there is a sewer that runs down to Triangle Street. We also explored reusing the sewer that leaves the evergreens from the eastern side. Um, the condition of that pipe is poor, and it also goes through town-owned land that's not a right-of-way, so there are legal issues with that, and we would still need to trench behind the evergreens to the west, um, right along the edge of the inner buffer well with inside the 50-foot. The reason that we are not 
uh, from the location of the building not going directly toward Marsh Hall across museum property is that that northern portion of the property has never been explored archaeologically and therefore any disturbance that we propose of the a disturbance in this case meaning um, excavation within that area would trigger uh, an extensive archaeological study including test pits along the entire length of the trench um, uh, just in order to be allowed to do that work. Whereas if we are just to the left of that property line onto Amherst College property, there are no archaeological restrictions whatsoever. Okay. And so, and just to reiterate, there's no sewer line in Main Street? Not in front of this property, no. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll wrap it up real quick. But did you just say that there's another in your a solution that would require there's a right of way by the town. Was there was that another option on the map? Um, I was trying to keep up with all the options. Yeah, sorry. There there is a so um, let let me sh if I have the ability to share, I'll bring up the plan and then I can point. Um, so uh, this is a portion of the building that we've been referring to as the Evergreens. Um, and mm -hmm. there is a sewer that leaves the western portion of this mm -hmm. building and runs west um, that has been out of service, uh, Jane could say exactly, for at least 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. The condition of that pipe is poor. It runs through town-owned land, but not. But that land is not in the right-of-way, so there would be easements required from the town. But also, it doesn't get us out of the disturbance within the 50-foot, because we would still need to try around the evergreens which itself yeah. is only 20 feet from once got it okay so it doesn't solve the 50 foot perhaps it minimizes a little bit you know okay this is your hand up again or just leave it up you're good okay all right um we need to move on with this one so i think chris has heard our comments and I'm looking for a motion to continue. I, I have, I was, I had my oh, hand. Sorry, couldn't see it. Go ahead, Alex. So um, when I was there, we had a, Jane, you were not, but I, we had a conversation with Chris about where was the historic boundary for the carriage house. And you've got those L-shaped blocks in the ground for which there was a picture, but you're not sure exactly where the carriage house was. Am I correct? Just no, I'm sorry. Uh, we do know exactly where the carriage house was. I apologize if I uh, didn't communicate that correctly. I thought there was a slight uncertainty, but um, I was not involved in the extensive research that was done on that location. I came on board after that. Okay, so I'll just say that um, the value of that tree that you want to take down, if you took the cost of the seedling and compounded its value forward the, the life of that tree it's worth thousands of dollars and would it really make a whole lot of difference to move that building over 10 or 15 feet to save the tree maybe that's just something to consider chris um and if they did move it 10 to 15 feet over would it damage the roots to the point where it would kill the tree anyway alex also, maybe that's rhetorical. Um, okay. May May I just refer us all back to the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Reconstruction? Yeah, I, I know Jane, but but we we're 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 just trying to uphold the bylaws of the town. Yeah, we're the Conservation yeah. Commission. I mean, we're the Conservation Commission. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think ultimately that's our response is that Jane's, um, you know, that that other standard that you're not upheld to, um, but we are with this project. Um, and so um, obviously the, the commission can decide what they want, but the, the building's been placed based on best practices under those guidelines. Andre. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're not... Uh getting confused between uh, between acts uh, by the federal government that uh, that essentially tell you what you need to do to preserve or do work on historical uh, buildings and so on versus 
the regulations that we're talking about today, what you have applied for, and that's what we're talking about is what you applied for. Not specific, let's not, uh, so I don't, you know, I think what you're trying, what you were trying to say before is that you have to, that any change would be very complicated because you still have to then um, get those changes approved through all these other permitting processes. But the Secretary of the Interior's uh, regulations or uh, laws, they're not, they don't, they don't compete with, uh, with the, with what we enforce here or with what we're, uh, you're uh, uh, requesting a permit for. So I, 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 Keep hearing you talk about the uh, these laws, and it's if it's in the context of um, you of making it more complicated for you to move the building, for example, I understand that. But uh, um, the Amherst Concom is not subject to the regulations, or is not subject to uh, or affected by um, those laws that you're talking about. Do, do you understand? Understood. And and I I'm approaching this more from the perspective of um, on the vast vast majority of requests and comments and questions when I'm in these hearings with conservation commissions and planning boards, we always try to look for what can we give to to sort of come to a middle ground. And this is one of those rare occasions where you know the museum being held to those obligations makes this something that that we can't just say, oh yes, we will move that building a little bit, which on really any other project would probably be a no-brainer that, that we would go ahead and do it. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Aaron. I was going to request that the commission continue this hearing and allow myself and Chris to um, talk offline to try to come up with reasonable um, adjustments that meet what the commission have, has asked for in terms of um, mitigation um, and potentially review that at the next meeting. Um, because I think that we're kind of at an impasse at this point and we have another hearing and just in the means of respecting everyone's time. Agree. Okay. Looking for a motion to continue. Okay. Move to continue the public hearing for 214 Main Street, Emily Dickinson Museum to 5824 at 7.50 p.m. A second. Andrea on the motion, Alex on the second. Rachel? Abstain, right? Okay. Um, Jason? Abstain. Alex? Aye. Bruce. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Nam and I. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jane. Have a good night. Thanks. We'll see you then. Bye. Right. Okay. Next up, we have. Abbreviated notice of resource delineation for a pure sky development incorporated on behalf of WD Coles Incorporated represented by Goddard Consulting for the confirmation of resource area boundaries on site, limited to areas that fall within the 100 foot feet of the proposed solar installation at Shootsbury Road, map 9B lots 11 and 12 and map 9D lots 27. Okay, so an update on this one is that we had the last meeting had continued and had requested some revisions to the plans, um, particularly putting a polygon around this, the project area where the resources were specifically delineated and updating the plan set to show revisions and the final date. Um, as I understand it, there are several plans that came in that did not meet those um, requests and something came in at the last minute that still had some outstanding items. So I believe we're gonna have to continue this um, because I think it came in right at the last minute today. Um, Aaron, do you wanna add anything to that? Um, yeah, so just to give the commission sort of, a, a, I mean, I don't know how much of a comprehensive update you want. Um, I was prepared to recommend that we issue tonight, um, but I understand from talking with the chair, based on Emily Stockman's review that there's still outstanding concerns. And I think that the concern, 
as I understand it, is that the initial revision that came through didn't include the revision dates of the original plan. Um, we requested that those be added, and I think that there was a little bit of a disconnect between the plan revisions for the plan set and the survey um, revisions. So the survey going out and picking up data in the field. So when the surveyor made the plan revisions, they updated the dates that they were out in the field collecting wetland points as opposed to the plan revisions. So I negotiated with Steve um, offline to try to get the final revision date added for today um, and sent that around to everybody hoping that we could approve tonight but I think there's still some concern that the um, dates of the various revisions for the plans that were submitted to the CONCOM were not included. Am yeah. I stating that accurately? Yeah, so I think that the title needs to be changed to show the final date and that some of the sheets were missing the final date. So it just wasn't a comprehensive revision showing the final dates and the revision box didn't list all of the revisions, um, for example, March. Um, so I'll give you guys five minutes um, if you want to respond to that or give us any updates on your part. So I don't know who wants to take this, Mark or Corey. I think Steve was on too. Okay, um, please you raise your hand, know. Steve, and we can add you. Okay. Right. Welcome, yeah. Steve. Welcome, so, Mark. Corey. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. No. So I think there was. I think, like you said, there was some disconnect in what you intended the revisions to be. We relayed that to the surveyor. They gave their version of it. We provided that, and then we just had some back and forth in the last couple of days about the final plan date being updated, um, as opposed to the last time that they surveyed the site, which I think is what the date on the actual plan shows. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a pretty simple fix, just needed some clarity and communication. And um, hopefully that'll just be very simple and provided to Aaron. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand now. Corey, do you want to add something? Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. So um, Aaron, just to be clear, because we were the ones who were um, requesting these updates with our surveyor, it was Meridian. Um, they had a list of the dates of all of the surveys that were shared with the CONCOM um, since we submitted back in October. And those were initially listed as a note. And then we did see this correspondence that you wanted to see those dates of the revised plans dropped into the revision box. So those dates were then dropped into the revision box. And unfortunately, there's not, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So the um, the the notes in the re the notes were fine as far as when the survey was done in the field. I think we're mixing up two things here. The dates that the surveyor went out and picked up the flags in the field are one set of revisions. The revisions that the commission is referring to that they want to see on the plans are. When you originally submitted your application, there was one date on your application, which was the date, the final date of your plan for the submission. Then Emily did her review, the plans were updated, and a revision was submitted to the commission. There was another subsequent set of revisions from there. So the dates that we're talking about are the actual plan submissions to the Conservation Commission as part of the ANRAD application not the date that the surveyor was out picking up flags in the field, if that makes sense. Right. So I think that there was a crossing of informational lines there. Okay, I okay. so those dates were, we shared those with them, and those were the dates that of the revised plans that we have shared with the commission, not the dates that they were in the field surveying. Aaron, do you have the dates? If Would that be helpful if you guys can sort of corroborate your timeline and the dates offline? Like their, their submission to the CONCOM dates, right? 
and and those were those were the dates that were added to the survey. You're muted, Aaron. Aaron, you're muted. Sorry. I don't have the dates at the tip of my fingers right now to, to list all of the dates, but what I can tell you is that between February 12th and April 24th, there were revisions made to the plan set um, that were not noted on the plan. Um, the, the notes that I saw on the revision boxes appeared to be um, related to this date that the surveyor was out in the field picking up flagging because there was like six revision dates. We only had, I want to say, from the original submission, we've had three revisions and there was multiple revisions noted in the revision box. So there was an initial, there was the original submission date. There was a revision from Emily going out initially with Steve Riberty in the field and hanging flagging. There were comments on the on the first revision for um, addressing um, the call outs and, and um, the various uh, designations of the various resource areas on the site. And then I believe there was a the final plan that was submitted to us. So those are the dates that I'm talking about. And if those if if I I can go back into my emails and list those dates because I have them all um, on the website of when plans were submitted to us, but I I don't have them available right now for this. Yeah, that's fine. I don't think we need to hammer them down right now. And just you know, the relevance to us is the back and forth that we had, especially with Emily Stockton and you, and the revisions that came from those conversations, right. not necessarily just the survey. Um, okay. I'm going to go to public comment. I see one hand up. Judy Eisman, I'm going to allow you to talk. Please take two minutes. Welcome, Judy. Yes, hello. Uh, I represent the Pelham Planning Board um, since we about the proposed project. I had planned to make some more extensive comments about my background and, and <laughs> why I have, feel competent to discuss this, but in the interest of time, um, I will s simply say that I believe that uh, since I last sat on a CONCOM, the, the uh, regulations have changed, um, apparently, uh, but in my opinion, um, Pure Sky is, uh, <laughs> by failing to delineate more of the property is really adding to its own problems here um, because we it's very difficult to understand uh, the entire project and the potential damage that could occur either during construction of uh, anything that is permitted or something else that goes on on the remainder of the property. At any rate, um, in briefly, uh, I think this area is not only inappropriate for such industrial use, but the main question is whether the cutting of trees for industrial solar panels is in furtherance of state policy, and I don't believe it is. I will be going to the zoning board hearing, and and I will attend the continuance of this hearing and give you more information, which I have already provided to the zoning board. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, Lenore, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Please take two minutes. Hi, um, Lenore, Strong Street Amherst. Thank you for your very good thorough work. This is a general statement, also as a liaison from Climate Action Now. Unfortunately, there's not enough understanding about how natural systems have always regulated the climate and how intact ecosystems like forests are critical to mitigate the disastrous effects of our current climate catastrophe. And even though the current Healy administration has outlined climate goals that that uh, that highlight restoring soil health, protecting green lands like forests. There remains archaic legislation and regulatory processes, a lack in, of an integrated regional approach, short-sighted policies and subsidy programs, and an inefficient lack of oversight. So we're crippled with this fragmented governance, leaving our local town boards and committees to have the foresight, courage, and clarity to do the right thing for our public, personal, and planetary health. And as you all know, because something is legal doesn't mean it's right, because something was perceived as right in the past doesn't mean it's right now, because something's right in theory or in certain places doesn't make it right in practice or in every place. 
So I'd like to offer you as the liaison of climate action now, a wealth of current resources, if you'd like, that include academic papers, scientific lectures, scholarly articles, websites, et cetera, that clearly make the case that installing industrial solar plants on any land that we need to protect water supplies, soil integrity, biodiversity, and to help prevent impacts of flooding droughts and the heat that's only getting worse is the wrong course of action to address the mess that we find ourselves in because of our disconnect with nature and our colonial economies based on resource extraction. So we urge you to do everything in your albeit limited power and your, con and your good conscience to make the right decisions and provide the necessary guidelines as you proceed with this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Alexandra, two minutes, please. Hi, uh, this is Alexandra Valunas from 201 Shootsbury Road um, in Amherst. I just wanted to continue that I feel that this uh, continue to say that I feel that this is a site that's very ill suited to any kind of industrial development. Um, the water supply, I feel like, would get run down all the way into Amethyst Brook with how things run. Like, I I've seen really some very bad solar projects where you have soil, soil erosion from cutting down trees upland. Like, again, I don't know nearly as much as many people have commented on this, um, but I do know that plot of land particularly well. I've walked all the way up to Leverett from that site. I've done grid walks in those backwoods over and over since I've been four years old and I'm nearly turning 40 now, um, 36 years of walking across all of that land. I can tell you again, there's many rare and endangered species back there that aren't in that wetland that only come up for maybe two weeks out of the year, some of which don't come up every year. They're affected by fungus networks between trees and require very specific soil function to exist. And so cutting down trees on that land is going to impact things that I have a poor understanding of and people who have, you know, PhDs and master's degrees and all kinds of things that really understand this much more deeply than I might. Um, but as just a local citizen that's been born in the area and lived here my entire life, I would strongly urge you to not allow this to continue with whatever power you're able to. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Renee, Renny, go ahead, two minutes, please. Good evening. Um, hi, Renee Moss, uh, Shoesbury Road, Amherst. Um, and just a quick comment. Um, we're here, we're looking at, uh, I believe, a 102 acre parcel of which 40 acres, 31 football fields are going to be clear, are pro being proposed to be clear cut. And what sort of perplexes me is why we don't, why in that latest plan that, that came through, why there's not, you know, why only those 40 acres is what we're showing the wetlands delineation of. It seems to me that clear cutting that amount of forest can't help but affect the other 60 acres, or at least, or or maybe not all 60 of them, but many of them, and why we are only requiring wetlands delineation on the 40 that's being cut down, when we know that once that's down, the water will flow differently, there will be a heat sink, there will be, there's, there will be so much reaction to that that massive amount of clear cutting that can't possibly not affect the land outside of that 40 acres, but within that parcel. So that's just, you know, I think as Alexandra um, said, I am not an expert, but it just sort of perplexes me as to, you know, why we're only looking at the 40 acres that are being cut down. So that's my comment and thank you all for your hard work on this. I appreciate, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Michael, two minutes, please. Oh, thank you. And uh, 
just like to say, many of you uh, on the board haven't had the full Pure Sky experience. Um, Laura's been here throughout the whole thing, I think, all the way back to 2019. And <laughs> what you're seeing here and what you've seen all along is typical of Pure Sky in action. Remember, they're the same company that let their original uh, ANRAD ORAD expire. Now they're back again. Now they're going through a process that should take a short period of time, should be pretty straightforward. And somehow over and over and over again, they manage to mess up small details and sometimes big details. They're creating a problem that's going to haunt them down uh, in the future by not delineating the entire parcel. They're trying to push this project through the ZBA without the Conservation Commission having approved the delineation in advance. The whole process has been really turned upside down, sideways, and it's just typical of how this company operates. Basically, they just seem to pile confusion upon confusion until boards just give up because they just don't want to deal with it anymore. And it looks like they're repeating the same mistakes again here. Um, you have to understand that what you're seeing here is not unusual for them. It's standard operating procedure. It's almost like no one's in charge and no one knows what any other part of the operation is doing. They're also a company that is not afraid to leave out things. In this case, they're leaving out major sections of the delineation and making believe that the wetlands that are in them don't exist. They have huge um, drainage areas that are draining into areas on the map that appear as grayed out hash marks like it's a black hole or something. Well, that's real property. That's real um, wetlands. And they try to kind of brush it off as, don't look here. So instead of seeing a, a real delineation on the map, you see grayed out rectangles, you see grayed out triangles. It's just incredible how poorly the, this company goes about doing their business. And it's scary to think that a company that has this much trouble just getting something as basic as an ORAD through is a company that you're going to trust to remove 40 acres of forest and put up a functioning solar operation. It's a scary thought. And I hope that you people will really hold them to a high standard because someone needs to. And unfortunately, there's many, many small towns around here that don't have the resources Amherst have, that don't have the staff that Amherst has, that don't have the volunteers that Amherst has, where this company has just bulldozed their way through and put up operations that are really, really scary. Okay, so, thank you, Michael. Um, I just want to respond uh, very, very briefly about, um, you know, our jurisdiction in relation to the cutting. And um, we don't take over our jurisdiction until there is an impact to the wetlands. So the forest cutting plan is not something that we have control over. Um, we can give our, we, we don't have anything in front of us, but we can give our comments on it. But that's a DCR jurisdiction. No? Okay, Aaron, fill me in. Michelle, there's no forest cutting plan. Um, no, no, I know there's none yet, but as far as like cutting surrounding the site, if it's outside of our jurisdiction, we have no ability to to do anything about that until there's impact. Right. I think we're getting, so yeah, I mean, they're going to be coming, once once we issue an, an ORAD, they're going to be coming back to us with a notice of intent application. They're going to need to have a notice of intent application they're crossing an intermittent stream, they're crossing an isolated wetland. Um, so there's going to be a notice of intent application to the Conservation Commission following the issuance of this ORAD in order to permit this project. At that time, the commission is gonna have the full authority to 
review the wetland delineation, review the proposed work, determine potential impacts. As far as the wetland delineation, I just would love to comment on this. I would love to see the entire wetland, the entire site delineated. It was previously delineated and confirmed as part of the previous ORAD, but we as a commission can only confirm the resource areas that the applicant has submitted to us. Um, do I think it's in their best interest to delineate the entire site? Absolutely. But if they choose not to, there's nothing that we can do to force them to do that if they choose not to do that. Mm -hmm. So we can only confirm the resource areas that are within the study area or the designated area that they ask us to confirm within. But I, but I think, sorry, I didn't raise my go hand. Ahead, go ahead, Laura. Um, I was going to say, but I think, Aaron, that that's a good point. While we can't require it, it's certainly something that, you know, would be great to see. Um, right. I'm, I would like to move to um, continue this for the night since it's late. I see your, your hand up, Corey, but I don't really want to get into a big discussion yet. Um, we can continue this when we have the full plan set in front of us and with all the requested and outstanding revisions. And I just wanted to provide that brief comment for the public just so, you know, where our process is more clear to you. Um, but for tonight, I'm looking for a motion to continue. Because this is uh, kind of a, a last minute um, discussion, I don't have a, a slide um, teed up for a continuance on this, but um, I can offer a time slot of May 8th at 7.55 for the continuation of the um, <clears throat> Uh, abbreviated notice of resource area delineation for pure sky on behalf of WD Coles at Shutesbury Road, um, DEP file number 0890727. All right, I move to move that, uh, move the hearing to, or to continue the hearing in uh, on May 8th at 7.55 p.m. Looking for a second. Everybody's okay. muted, so if you're talking, we can't hear you. I think I had Bruce on the second. So okay. Andre on the motion, Bruce on the second. Rachel. Same. Jason. Abstain. Bruce. Bye. Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Same. I'm an I. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a good night. Okay, we still have a couple more items of business here. Um, I have a jurisdictional question. Maybe I should use it. I'll, I'll ask it offline. Okay. Um, let's see. I guess we're just at enforcement updates. Okay. Yes. Let's, let's start with Trillium. So Alex and I went out to um, 11 Trillium um, the Thursday following uh, our April 10th meeting, and the site certainly looked a lot better um, out on that site visit and definitely give Alex a chance to give his comments. Um, my recommendations were at that site visit, um, number one, that the the slope was supposed to have erosion control blankets on the entire extent of the slope, and they had only um, put erosion control blankets on the upper half. Also, um, to my knowledge, there had been no seeding of the slope um, under the erosion control blankets, which was a requirement. So we were told, we advised them um, to get conservation seed mix from um, appropriate vendor and to uh, seed the entire slope and to um, complete putting down erosion control blankets on the remaining slope. Also, um, the the owner and I discussed the fact that there is some, uh, it's, it's not clear where the extent of the 100 foot buffer is on this site. They measured it with a measuring tape. Um, my concern is that we need to have the 100 foot buffer marked um, bounded essentially by um, a surveyor because I don't believe that the measurement that the owner provided is entirely accurate. And um, I think that the commission needs to see that 
completed in order to understand the where their jurisdiction lies and to be able to sort of move forward with whatever they might require from this point forward. Um, there was some fill which was remaining in place on the slope. I did question that because some of the trees were still buried um, and the owner was concerned that it was not possible to reach the area where the fill was located with a piece of equipment and was concerned that they were going to cause a bigger stability issue and also violate the enforcement order by bringing equipment down into that area. So um, it, we wanted to bring it to the remaining group to explain sort of the overall conditions. And Alex, if you have anything to add, please. Well, I just have a question because when I was there, which was a couple few weeks now, um, the same issue of not having equipment on the slope to remove the fill was was an issue then and they were hand removing it and there was shovels and buckets down there. So why can't they just continue to do that? So is there a reason? Yeah, um, I mean, yes, <laughs> and we, there was hand removal going on and there was a, quite a bit of hand removal that had been done, particularly beyond the erosion controls in the resource area. Um, I don't disagree with you. Um, we're, I certainly brought this up. The, the comment from the owner was that it was too much to do by hand um, and that a piece of equipment would be needed. It, I I do think it is a substantial amount of fill that's on the slope that was kind of sloughed off um, and, le and left there. Um, it was not permitted, um, but I think it would be a major task to do that by hand, which again, if the commission wants it, then that's what needs to be done. It's, we're just reporting back to you of what the owner is sort of yeah, advocating I mean, it's for. like silty free dirt that's just poised to go into that stream. Um, anyway, uh, and I also just wanted to point out that within the area that is, uh, you know, the 100 foot buffer line, which is unknown exactly, there's been some installments of like uh, lighting with concrete footings. Um, so I just wanted to point out that uh, I think we should ratify the enforcement order that the hundred foot buffer needs to be surveyed and bounded with a, you know, a month time frame on that, because there's a lot of productivity and installments of things happening. And um, I don't think we have a clear understanding of where it is. And he's putting it right on what he thinks is the line. So it's going to be, it's going to be tight no matter what. Uh, Andre. So um, let me, just ask those of you who are uh, most in the know there um what they're they're talking about uh, or they're concerned the homeowners are concerned that um getting equipment in there to remove that um that extra fill is um it's going to do what it's going to violate our uh, our enforcement order is that what they're so the enforcement order states that equipment cannot enter the slope. Um, and that was intentional because I didn't want them driving the equipment down onto the slope to try to remove it um, because it was already so destabilized. Um, and so my advice was remove by hand um, and what you can reach from staying on the upper part of the lot behind the erosion control barrier. If you could use the arm of the equipment to reach down and carefully um, uh, remove the fill that that was feasible, but beyond that, um, that they should not have equipment on the slope. Right. Protect and it. So there, um, you know, what they were, what they've been doing right now has been uh, some removal by hand and uh doing some other taking some other steps to uh, uh to comply and but what is their proposed solution to uh the re how do they propose to remove the uh remainder of what they've uh filled in there Nick, so can you just hold that picture aaron yes i can uh, yeah go ahead alex please yeah I, if you'll recall, the homeowner uh, was in a bit of a bind. He was leaving 
on a plane to go get his 92 year old mother who was moving to his house. And there was some urgency in, in arresting the erosion. And he went out and bought this blanket that you're looking at um, locally. It happened to have been available. There's a long length of it. And it was going to take him another two weeks to order the same amount. His son showed up on the scene, was very helpful. Um, when Aaron said that recommended a conservation seed mix, he got right on the phone with the store that Aaron identified and bought uh, the seed. They were very responsive, but it was kind of like, what do I do first? And uh, he was under the impression that he needed to do something to stop the erosion. So um, there was a discussion about um, getting more out or, and I, I don't recall a discussion about what the priority was, but he moved as fast as he could to stop the erosion. And once he learned from Aaron that an error had been made and his son got involved, uh, he moved quite quickly to try and correct things with, with good intentions. So my feeling is that the, unless we order it, the, the fill that was down the slope will stay there. And what he'll try and do is seed it and put the blanket over it all the way to the stream to try and arrest the, uh, uh, the erosion, whether or not that fill is deep enough to injure the trees, given what's been removed is a whole nother question. But um, 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 and and I was there when we talked about the lighting that he put in. You know, I think some of it just showed up in the picture. There's some of it. Yeah. And requests were made to have it surveyed. I don't think he's acted on that yet, but he probably would. Um, I don't, he's trying hard to cooperate and he's gotten his son involved who is very good at uh, communicating and getting things done. But I, I don't think he's going to have an army of people down there uh, carrying buckets out of soil. It, it may be there forever unless we order it removed. Thanks, Alex. And Aaron, it looks like the plastic uh, stuff is still down in the front. They were going to be replacing that, but it's not been replaced. Which we, we can go back to that. Jason, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, uh, still, I'm still on my question. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, the, oh, the question of whether... why well, can't I'm you... just trying to clarify what... Um, trying to clarify one um what's down there and two uh what you know uh i guess what are we going to do with it you know uh is it okay to leave it there um and if uh if it's okay to leave it there then all right um but otherwise i mean uh i'm also trying to i, I i'm not i'm getting a little bit confused but is uh aaron is this uh, this is something that you learned about after the fact, or did you had you spoken to these folks beforehand? As far as the remaining fill, no. Um, uh, did you learn about the? Did we learn about the? Um, uh, that fill and uh, so on after you had already spoken to them, or was this just? Uh, we never uh, they. So have you spoken to them before uh, they did any work? I guess I'm a little confused by the question. So I'll just, right. oh, I'll just, I'm going to try my best to answer it. So they had no permission to put place fill on the slope whatsoever. That's why they have the enforcement order. They were supposed to remove all of the fill. Um, I think they did do a, a pretty decent job um, removing the material that was in resource area by hand. Um, and I think they did a decent job removing, I would say, 85% of the fill that was on the slope. The only amount that's remaining is this, this area that I keep highlighting here. You can see the trees are still buried. Um, it's it's just beyond where the bucket can reach um, on this, this slope. It's not a huge area. I would say it's maybe 15 feet by, say, 
I'd say maybe 15 by 15 foot. Um, and it's, it's, it's not a tremendous amount of fill. Um, and my concern was the girdled trees, like the trees that are buried, that they're going to be killed. Um, so my advice to them was until we could get a further read from the commission was to hand shovel out the um, bases of those trees so that they're not killed by the fill and that the commission ultimately would need to make a decision as to whether that fill needed to come out or whether it could be stabilized. For me personally, my, my professional opinion is to leave it there and stabilize it, um, to not have them do any more because I'm concerned that they're making forward progress on stabilizing at this point, and I'd rather see the site stabilized and get some native vegetation growing there, um, as opposed to having them continue to have um, disruption and and uh, excavation in that area. But I, you know, it's like six of one, half a dozen of the other, how we proceed with this. Um, I guess I'm just thinking button up the site as quickly as we can as the growing season begins to try to stabilize the slope. Um, and I do think once we get that 100 foot buffer um, uh, bounded, we're going to be having a bigger discussion, which is them filing a notice of intent to restore the area that they damaged um, in some capacity. Thank you. Jason. Uh, yeah, I want, I've, I think two or three questions here, but first I agree with Aaron that if they can get that fill out from around the trees, that would probably be, um, the most, the quickest remedy. Um, I certainly don't, I don't want to see them taking equipment down on slopes or anything like that. So I think that would be the best thing to do by hand. Um, I did want to ask, I thought that we had said they needed to use a biodegradable it did. blanket and none of that is biodegradable. That's standard like S150 straw with polypropylene netting. Yes. So we did talk to them about that. They said that it was, they were not able to get it. They said that they tried to order it and that it was not available. Um, this it would, was... take, it would take two weeks. Yeah, they they had they they ordered everything they could with what was available, which is that option, and that the other material was going to take an additional two weeks to to do the remaining slope, which is the lower portion of the slope. So they were ordering, I believe, from Amherst Farmer Supply um, or some other local source. But um, yeah, they they said it was a sourcing issue. So that, I, I you know what I don't honestly I don't buy that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they can call up EJ Prescott there in Springfield. They deliver all over the place. Like there's a lot of places that carry erosion control blanket. Um, I know that they potentially the homeowners wouldn't necessarily have a good list of people to call, but the contractor, whoever did this should know. I mean, it's spring in Massachusetts. It's raining. Erosion control blanket is an item that all these places have stocked. Um, so I would really, you know, and, and if they're going to seed this area and put erosion control blanket down, you got to put the seed down first, then put the erosion control blanket down or you're, you know, you lose a bunch of seed by it not being in contact with the soil. So is their intention to potentially in two weeks when they get this other material, remove all of the non-biodegradable and then seed and then recover it? <laughs> hasn't been covered i would like to see all that polypropylene taken up i mean that was a condition that we gave in the enforcement order and it's basically just suffocating that ground with plastic i mean that's that's a lot of area that would otherwise be natural leaf litter um that's going to have a sheet of plastic under it so well uh, it's also an entanglement like yes I'll say that. all right. kinds of things that are using the resources they're going to get trapped in that netting and that's one reason why a lot of places don't allow for that net type of netting anymore okay yeah and that's just sticking to the original conditions that we gave them yes. go ahead alex my gut is that the house the owner with his son did what they could as fast as they could um they don't have knowledge of Springfield and I, but on, on the flip side, 
I think they'd be perfectly willing to rip that out and put down what you want. I think they were just trying to do something to respond to Aaron talking to them about uh, trying to stop the erosion. So I don't think there was, um, I don't think they were intent intentionally disregarding the order. I think they were just trying to be expedient to doing something with okay. what they could find. Fair enough. Um, I understand that. So let's just, like, as you said, Alex, they just need clear instruction. So let's be clear about that and provide maybe additional resources for them to get it. And if, you know, even if they can't get it in two weeks, put the order in so it can happen. I, I, I They have a whole entire unstabilized backyard right now. Do we have any idea what their plans are for that? I, I assume some of them in hydro it. It's probably sodded by now. They they were going to put in an irrigation system and then sod the entire area. Wait, which okay. area is this? The back or the front? The lawn. The backyard. It, oh, the backyard. Yeah, okay. I'll show you the area. Okay. Well, my thought, my my train of thought was that if they were going to have somebody come in and hydro seed, that that would be an option for the slope as well. Hydro seed it with conservation mix and a hydraulic mulch, and that would take care of the problem. But it sounds oh, if it's already, if it's already sodded, then it it is what it is. He's probably got sod down right now. Yeah, that's what I was. Uh, that's what I had initially recommended. Um, they decided to do that instead. Um, so I have I have a list of conditions here for a ratified enforcement order. I just want to make sure I have these correct. And if anybody has anything to add, the first is to survey and bound the 100 foot buffer within a 30 day period. The second is to um, hand remove the fill from around the tree trunks and seed and stabilize um, the fill in place that is not girdling the trees. Um, that they remove the um, uh, existing blanket, which was not what was um, requested, and replace it with a biodegradable erosion control blanket after they put the seed down. Um, so I have those one, two, three, four conditions. Um, does anybody have anything else that they want to add to the ratified enforcement order? We give them a timeline for the survey. A 30 day window okay. for the, the um, survey. I'm good, anybody else? I think it's good. Okay, so we just need a motion to ratify the enforcement order with the noted conditions. I move to ratify the enforcement order with the noted conditions. I second that. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. Okay. And then um a wildflower. Wildflower. I have heard that the um the owner, so I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but <clears throat> myself, Bruce, and Alex did sit down and and Dave Zomek sat down with the owner um, in the town room. And he had um, promised the group that he was going to put uh, erosion controls in place that day or immediately following the meeting and that he was going to um, reach out to um, a wetland professional to take care of the filing of his notice of intent. I did give him a list of local wetlands consultants. Um, when I was out inspecting um, in that vicinity, I did check the um, Wildflower Drive location to see if erosion controls had been installed. They still have not been as of um, just a few days ago. So we're still waiting on erosion controls. And um, I know that he did reach out to at least one wetland consultant who was considering taking um, the project, but they ultimately decided not to. Um, so I don't know if he has gotten a wetland consultant, but I do know that April 30th is the deadline for his enforcement order. So I'll keep you, I'll continue to keep the commission posted, um, but it looks like it might, we might be hitting a deadline at the end of April, and then this will be on for the May 8th uh, meeting for discussion. Sorry, are you planning on reaching out to him again? 
just to remind him of that deadline so we don't have to get to that point. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to remind him. Um, I'm trying to be as um, diplomatic as possible, but I I have been told multiple different stories at this point. Um, so I'm, uh, I will reach out um, and I'm not sure what the commission wants the messaging to be. Like if the 30 days is not met, then what is going to be the repercussion and or are you going to give him more time? Um, what is sort of the consensus of the commission? Andre? I'll give a piece of my mind. Um, you know, I think that uh, you've already spoken to him, uh, taken the time to speak to him at at the office. And he's made a promise. How many days ago was this? Um, it was I, I'm, it was right around our last meeting date. I'm not sure if it was immediately before or after our last meeting. Yeah, 12, 13. It was just 12, a couple of days after. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, right around the time. And he, and he was going to do this right away. And in the meantime, we've, we've been having all this rain. Uh, and the resource continues to get damaged. And uh, if he, you know, and he's been on notice. So I think the next step is to, uh, to be more forceful about it. And that would be, I would, I, you know, I would either fines. I mean, he has to do this. He's got to do something about it. You can't just leave it. So the consequences of not doing what you're, uh, what you uh, are through an enforcement order uh, instructed to do, uh, there should be some kind of consequences. And um, I don't have a problem. I mean, I know that it uh, can get complicated when we uh, begin to levy fines, but uh, I mean, he's got to do something. Okay, so um, Alex has his hand up. Hold on, one sec. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, maybe outside what we actually do with this enforcement order, but one of the issues that was on my mind when I visited is he's only allowed to cut down fifty percent of the basal area within the wetland boundary, and we don't know if he did that. So uh, all the stumps are piled up, and. I talked to Aaron about the possibility of having somebody figure out what the basal area is of the standing trees within the buffer. And I even volunteered to go down with their D tape and measure all the DBHs of the trees, but it wouldn't take very long. And then with the stumps, if he brought a backhoe in, we could measure the diameter of the stumps, estimate the basal area and find out if he had a violation of cutting down more than 50% of the trees in addition to the violations that Aaron's got now. And that's good <laughs> sleuthing, but should that be on us or him? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, for we shouldn't really be entering the property without the landowner's sort of consent. Um, so I'm a little concerned about too much um, issue that might like potentially be a trespass issue. Um, but I do... I, I have a, a sense of, you know, I can have a conversation with him in advance of the meeting on the third or in advance of the April 30th deadline, which I know is fast approaching. Um, I could also talk to our um, town attorney and see if um, maybe they send a strongly worded letter and I can, you know, seek some guidance on, um, you know, if there is no action, sort of what our um, some other potential um, actions might be and certainly fining. Um, so is the commission thinking, I mean, so I think having a conversation with him might be a good idea. It could be he reached out to 10 different consultants and nobody could take it. So I don't know if it's a matter of him um, making efforts and just not having progress. Maybe he's found somebody and he's working on it so I can get kind of an update. But I'm just not going to have a meeting between now and then. So um if he's made substantial efforts, I'm going to continue to suggest that he continue making forward momentum on filing a permit. If it seems like he has not made efforts and he's sort of things aren't going anywhere, then um, I think more of a um, strongly uh, yeah. 
in, in strong enforcement action would be necessary, if that makes sense. Yep, go ahead, Alex. The gentleman, when we met with him, was was somewhat surprised. He had written checks before the work was done to people to do the work, trusted them to do it. Uh, he's not somebody who's done this before. I don't mean the violation. I mean, uh, bought a, a lot and built a house for himself. Um, he sort of knew at that and uh, knew at everything that, that we're talking about. And he was um, very cordial during the meeting. Um, he thought he was going to get beat up at the meeting, and he wasn't at all. He was very happy about that. And Dave was very nice just trying to bring him into compliance. So I don't think we have somebody who is being obstinate. I think that we just got somebody who has uh, trusted people too much and paid them before they did the work and got himself in trouble. Um, and by the way, in just saying I go in and do the detail, uh, I don't really want to do that. I'm just, that's was my way of saying it's an easy thing to do. Sure. We have pictures before they stumped and that might be useful too. Go ahead, Laura. Um, so my, th I mean, it sounds like the period is almost over with it anyways, that it's 430 as far as like when he needs to have some stuff done. Um, I'm kind of with Andre, like if he doesn't get stuff done, like we need to you know, he might be very well intentioned and I'm glad to hear that, but it's not like malicious, but um, I mean, I guess within a week we'll be having, you know, you'll know Aaron very clearly whether or not he's taking what you said seriously. So um, because the truth is, if he called all 10 and wasn't able to make progress, the next call should be to you to say, I, I don't know what to do, you know, right. um, and he hasn't done that. So, I mean, right. um, anyways, it's kind of, you know, uh, I guess you need something from us in terms of like what you know voting on a next step or no I mean I think I'll just use my best discretion to try to manage the situation and mm -hmm. to be totally honest with the group it's it is complete triage at this point I'm I'm getting calls I'm getting emails I'm we've got permit filings coming in I've got construction kicking off um We've got emergencies happening and I'm trying to manage enforcement. So I'm I'm going to do my very best um, to manage everything that's going on. But it's just hard to sort of manage people uh, to do the right thing. And also, like, it's it's administratively intensive to do it. But I'll, I will do my best to bring yeah. us to a positive result at the next meeting. Yeah, but you already kind of done it. You've already kind of sat down with him and had the I mean, it's kind yeah. of like you've done what you can do. So right. that's my opinion, at least. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Laura. Okay, so I think you have what you need from us on this. Yes. Um, thank you for following up. Um, I guess we'll be hearing about it, but uh, definitely utilize the lawyer strongly worded letter uh, if you can, and okay. hopefully we'll get some better news. Okay, um, I think we're at the end of our agenda. Yes, um, public comment, mm -hmm. general public comment, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, looking for a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn at I second that. 956, Bruce. <laughs> Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Good night, everyone.